You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million on my head. I'm the better player. I'm the I just win. I don't want to get a million dollars. The devil that's it. And I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the second part of What If Deku Joins the Batman. Smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. The results. 497 498 499 500 Izuku collapsed on the floor his muscles aching from the push-ups. He absently looked around his room. Once its walls and shelves bore all kinds of All Might memorabilia. Not anymore. The walls were bare save a calendar and poster board. Most of his furniture was removed to allow him to make room for training. Perhaps Bruce's minimalist decorating style was rubbing off on him. He continued with his workout, moving on to crunches. It had been a week since the entrance exam at UA High. Bruce had to return to Gotham after the exam, so it had been radio silence from him since then. Waiting for the exam results was torture. He felt he did well at first but taking down the zero pointer took up the rest of the time for the test. He didn't blame Uraraka, though. It was a situation that couldn't be helped. All they could do was wait patiently for the results and hope that they scored enough points for them to get in. After the test, he and Uraraka began to hang out more regularly, becoming a lot closer. Izuku had learned more about her and her family. She came from an impoverished family. Her father owned a construction company but didn't find much business. Due to villain or criminal attacks, several construction agencies gained government contracts to repair the damage. Because of this, heroes and businesses would often default to these so-called government-approved companies to help them in building their agencies. This made business very scarce for non-contract companies. If a business was not able to get a government contract, their options were very limited in private enterprise projects or home construction, as was the case for Uraraka's family. Still, her father found work where he could, and always put on a brave face despite their circumstances. He was a man that Izuku could respect. It also taught Uraraka a strong sense of humility and frugality. She did not let anything go to waste and found creative ways to save money. It was because of her family that Uraraka wanted to be a hero in the first place. She hated seeing her family suffer from poverty. Because heroes often became independently wealthy, both from hero work and capitalizing on their fame with side businesses, Uraraka wanted to provide a comfortable life that her parents deserved. She wanted to be their hero. That was a dream that Izuku found admirable. There were many other things that he also admired about Uraraka. She was strong, intelligent, quick thinking under pressure, determined, and loyal to a fault. Her strong desire to save people led her to want to become a rescue hero. He had no doubt that she had everything it took to make a great hero. Izuku finished his workout. He could smell his mother's cooking and became very aware of how hungry he was. Standing, he was about to leave when his door suddenly slid open. His mother was standing there, holding a letter in her hands. Izuku, she said excitedly. It's here. The letter sat atop Izuku's desk, sealed with wax and branded with the UA seal. He had been staring at it for ten minutes. After each minute, he resolved to open it. The minutes continued to pass. The letter remained unopened. He shook his head and slapped his cheeks. Come on, Izuku. He snapped at himself. You can do this. Hands shaking, he ripped open the envelope, which was heavier than he anticipated for its size. When it was opened, a small, gray disc-like device hit the table with a dull thud. Izuku looked at it, puzzled. As he reached out to pick it up, the device sprang to life, startling Izuku. A holographic projection appeared, a familiar-looking, handsome man in a black suit looking back at him. Hello, Midoriya, said Bruce Wayne, his voice projecting from the device. Bruce, Izuku said, what's going on? Isn't this from UA? The administration at UA let me record this message personally, considering the fact that I sponsored you, the holographic Bruce said. Izuku blushed slightly at the fact that he had tried to talk to a hologram but regained his composure. You performed adequately in the entrance exam, said Bruce, his face gaunt. You scored a total of 30 hero points. Not exactly your best work. I've certainly seen you perform better. Izuku bowed his head. So, this was it. He didn't make it after all. It only made sense that Bruce would be the one to tell him that all his training was a waste, that he was a failure. But that's not important. Izuku lifted his head, confused. You demonstrated your true nature during the exam, said hologram Bruce. Once again, you put yourself at risk to help someone in need. 
Not only that, you accomplished a seemingly impossible task, and defeated a nearly unbeatable foe with no thought to your own safety. To the end, you are always thinking about others, and when someone's in trouble, you don't question, you act. These traits are what it truly means to be a hero, not useless points. Izuku held his breath. What did he mean? You showed them all, Izuku, Bruce said. Just like I knew you would. You showed them you have what it takes to be a hero, even without a quirk. The hologram Bruce stood up, brushing himself off. You're in, kid, he said. And with that, the hologram shut down. Izuku couldn't hold back his tears. All these years of planning and dreaming. All these months of training. It was all happening. They were coming true. He was going to be a hero. He only wished that Kakin was alive to be there with him. After the exam, Batman stood on the giant wall outside the faux city. He had seen Izuku take down the villain robots, as well as the Zero Pointer. He couldn't have been prouder. He knew the boy had it in him, and now, he proved it not only to the school and the other applicants, but to himself as well. He was on his way to becoming a great hero. I knew I'd find you up here. Batman didn't react to the loud, booming voice, nor when the hulking frame of All Might stood next to him, placing a large hand on his shoulder. It's been a long time, my friend, said All Might. How have you? Would you knock that off, Toshinori, said Batman. I know you're almost at your three-hour limit, and you look ready to burst. All Might paused, taken aback. In a flash of smoke, the massive All Might reduced in size. So, you do know, said All Might. For how long? Was it Gran Torino that told you? No, said Batman. I've known since your fight with All for One. All Might blanched in surprise at the name. Yes, I know about that, Batman added. He lifted his arm horizontally, and holographic projection emanated from his gauntlet. It displayed medical data from All Might's surgeries five years ago. You were severely wounded, said Batman, going through the data, and it's hindering your abilities. Your body can't keep up with your quirk anymore. Eventually, you'll lose your powers permanently. You really are the world's greatest detective, said All Might, raising an eyebrow. Then you must know why I'm here at UA. Two reasons, replied Batman. No one would dare attack a weakened symbol of peace when he's surrounded by so many other dangerous heroes. And as for the other, Batman's hologram switched to a picture of a beautiful, green-haired woman. You're looking for a successor to inherit one for all. All Might coughed violently, blood spewing from his mouth. Batman had called his bluff. He knew more than All Might anticipated. He even knew about his predecessor, Nana Shimura. Her picture from his projector caught him completely off guard. How? He said sharply. How do you know all that? Batman lowered his gauntlet, the projection powering down. I know quirks, he said simply. And you have the exact same powers as your mentor, as did her mentor before her, and their mentors for as long as recorded. There are only two ways that can happen, genealogical heritage, or transference. The evidence points to the latter, supported by the fact that I have seen powers transfer between hosts before. All Might was shaking. Now it was starting to make sense. All those years ago, when they first met, it had always bothered All Might how Batman seemed to know how to take him down. It seemed impossible to comprehend at the time, and just chalked it up to experience. But now he knew how he did it. How long have you been studying me? Spat All Might. A long time, said Batman. Since your time at UA. Keep your friends close, and your potential enemies closer. I am not your enemy, Bruce, said All Might. But I suppose that's as close as you'll get to having a friend. I assume you've been doing the same to all your friends. Even Clark. Diana. I don't apologize for what I have to do to protect lives, said Batman. No one is incorruptible. Not me, not Superman, not even the symbol of peace. Enough, Bruce, said All Might. That's not what I came here for. No, it's not, said Batman, folding his arms. This is about Midoriya. It's no coincidence that you took him in after I told him All Might paused. After I said he couldn't be a hero. You're right, it's not, confirmed Batman. Why? Why not? I'm being serious, Bruce. So am I, said Batman. I saw something in the boy that you didn't. He's gifted, even without a quirk, and I wasn't about to stand by and let him waste that talent. I was concerned for his safety, said All Might. He was just attacked by that sludge villain. He wouldn't have made it as a hero. How can you say that after watching that performance? Batman shot back, pointing at the exam site. All Might didn't have an answer for that. I just didn't want to get his hopes up. It would have gotten him killed. If I recall, you yourself were born without a quirk, Tashinori, said Batman. But Nana Shimura saw something in you. What makes Midoriya so different? Leave her out of this, snarled All Might. The difference is that she gave me her quirk. The most powerful quirk known to man. I was able to defend myself with it, to fight villains, to save others. Save others like young Bakugou. What? said All Might. Katsuki Bakugou, said Batman. He was the boy I pulled out of the sludge villain. 
He was Midoriya's childhood friend. He blames himself for his friend's death. He himself had a powerful quirk but was defenseless against the villain. All Might was caught off guard again. Bagyuku's death because of his rookie mistake was not a memory that he liked to relive. Neither of us were able to save him. He said, What's your point? Come on, Toshinori, said Batman impatiently. The point is that a powerful quirk doesn't make the hero. Your quirk didn't make you great, it was your training, your knowledge, your experience. Have you forgotten these things already? He pointed to the destroyed giant robot. That is what you witnessed during that exam. Midoriya used his training, his knowledge, his instincts. That's why he passed, not because of a powerful quirk. It's true, you can't save everyone. But people aren't saved by quirks. They're saved by people. Is that why you're doing this? Said All Might. To spite me, because I've become jaded to the cause. Hardly. Then what is it about? Said All Might. Revenge. Training him to get revenge on the monster who killed his friend. No, said Batman. This isn't about you or me. Nor is it about revenge. This is about justice. For Bakugou and for Midoriya. He needs to see his friend's killer brought to justice. So, let the heroes handle that, Bruce, said All Might. He was almost killed by it once, so let the professionals bring it to justice. You'd be sending him to the slaughter. You of all people should know how dangerous it is out there, how dangerous it is to be a hero. Batman turned to leave. Midoriya may not be ready to find Bakugu's killer, but he already has what it takes to be a hero, he said. All he needs is guidance. Bruce, please, All Might implored. He's going to end up hurt, or worse. Do you want him to end up like you? Think about Jason. Batman paused at the name. Do you want Midoriya to end up like him? Bruce turned and looked All Might dead in the eyes. That's exactly why he's here, he said. So that he won't. Batman took his grapple gun from his belt and launched it, zipping off into the distance. All Might grew back into his powered form, smoke billowing from his pores. He glared as the dark silhouette of Batman shrunk in the distance. I may not be able to stop Midoriya, he said through gritted teeth, but I will protect him. From danger, from villains, even from you. You have everything you need, Master Midoriya. Yes, Alfred, replied Izuku. It was the first day of his new life at UA. The acceptance rate into the hero program was just as small as it ever was, only one in 300. Forgotten on recommendations, and even though Izuku was sponsored by Bruce Wayne, he didn't count since he took the entrance exam. His mother had fussed over him before he left, as mothers do. He had planned on taking the train, but was surprised to see Alfred was already waiting for him with the car, and he had fussed over Izuku almost as much as his mother did. Quite an exciting day, said Alfred cheerfully. I remember driving Master Bruce to his first day of school at Roxbury Fielding Academy back in Gotham. It was hardly a school for heroes, but in a way it was there that Master Bruce's hero journey began. Izuku had never thought to ask where Bruce had went to school. His knowledge was extensive and wasn't limited to criminology. And according to rumor, Batman was considered to be one of the most intelligent heroes on the planet. He had to have gained the knowledge from somewhere. Come to think of it, he had never asked Bruce about how or when he had become the Batman in the first place. He knew the reasons behind him being a hero was the death of his parents, but it was a mystery as to the circumstances that led him to become his alter ego. Alfred, yes, Master Midoriya, how did Bruce learn to? I mean, when did he first become? Izuku was having trouble formulating the question. I believe you want to know about when Master Bruce first donned the cape and cowl, correct? Alfred said. Yeah, replied Izuku. As you know, Master Bruce had a troubled childhood, said Alfred. The trauma of losing his parents. It was earth-shattering. As he had no immediate family other than his parents, I took over the responsibility of raising the young master. Izuku knew this much from his conversations with Bruce and Alfred. They had a very father-son-like relationship, and Alfred was more loyal to Bruce than anyone, his conscience and voice of reason. Bruce tried to live a normal life, and I tried to provide it for him, continued Alfred. But as the years passed, it became clearer and clearer that any hope of a normal life died with his parents. He had another destiny to fulfill. Master Bruce left Gotham for a while, continued Alfred. I had hoped that getting away would help him find healing and peace. It was during these travels where he developed the skills he employs now, and after eight years he finally returned to Gotham. And I hardly recognized the man who stood before me. It was as if the Bruce I knew as a child had completely transformed. It was both amazing and frightening. Here we are, sir, Alfred added, pulling up alongside the curb, just outside the UA gate. Thank you, Alfred. Izuku was glad there wasn't anyone around. He always felt uncomfortable driving around in the limo. Alfred opened the door for him, and he began to proceed towards the gate when Alfred placed his hand on his shoulder, stopping him. Before you go, sir, said Alfred. If this old man can part some wisdom, Master Bruce became what he needed to become. 
both for the city he defended, as well as for himself. These are different times, yes, but you must remain true to yourself. As you take these first steps into your hero's journey, focus on becoming the hero that you need to become, not what you think others need you to be. Alfred bowed his head and entered back into the car, leaving Izuku to ponder his words. Turning, Izuku paused a moment to take in the impressive building before him that would be his home for the next three years, and give him the starting point he needed to fulfill his dream of becoming a hero. He only hoped that, as Alfred put it, along the way, he became the hero that he needed to be. Izuku was running late, so he quickened his pace as he searched for his homeroom classroom. The hero course students were split into two home classes, 1A and 1B. Izuku was in the former. Beyond that, he knew nothing about his class, not even who the homeroom teacher was. Finally, he came upon a large door, stretching from the ceiling to the floor, with one a painted in large, red print across it. Izuku stopped and marveled at the door, chuckling slightly to himself. Yue was nothing if not ostentatious. As Izuku pushed the door open, the sound of a familiar voice reached his ears. Keep your feet off the desks, said Tenya Ida animatedly thrashing his arms through the air as he yelled at one of the other students. We must not disrespect this academy by scuffing school property. Ida glanced towards the door and stared right at Izuku as he stood in the entryway. It's him, he whispered, a look of awe on his face. At this, the entire class spun their heads in unison, looking directly at Izuku, who suddenly felt as if he was under a spotlight. Oh, hi, Izuku said, unsure of what else to say. Good morning, said Ida, marching with a purpose up to Izuku. My name is Tenya. Ida, I know, Izuku said, smiling despite himself. It's nice to meet you. I'm Izuku Midoriya. Ida's look of amazement increased, his face almost beaming. That's right, he said. You already know who I am. You also realized that there was something more to the practical exam, didn't you? Er, Izuku said. You must be very perceptive, said Ida, bowing his head respectfully. I completely misjudged you, I admit. As a student, you are far superior to me. Whoa there, said Izuku, holding his hands up. Let's not get carried away. It's true, the zero pointer was the real test. But that's not why I. And you're modest, Ida said, bowing deeply. Truly, it will be an honor to be your classmate, Midoriya. Well, Aizuku felt himself blush as the rest of the class continued to stare at him. Deku, as if on cue, Yuraraka came running up behind Izuku, who turned to her just in time for her to wrap her arms around him in a tight hug. Izuku could feel every eye in the classroom burning into the back of his head. In Japan, public displays of affection such as this was considered a social faux pas, even for couples. Izuku and Yuraraka weren't dating, but after all they had been through, they simply felt comfortable enough with each other that they exchanged hugs all the time. When they broke apart, Izuku could see out of the corner of his eye a mix of glares and whispers from his classmates. This was getting off to a great start. Ahem, said Ida awkwardly. Well, very good then. He turned to Yuraraka. My name is Tenya Ida, it is a pleasure to meet you. Achako Yuraraka, she replied cheerfully. It's a pleasure to meet you too. I'm so happy that we're in the same class together, said Yuraraka, turning back to Izuku. I wonder what our teacher's like. I can't wait to meet everybody. If you're just here to make friends, you can pack up your stuff now. Izuku, Ida and Yuraraka jumped in unison and followed the voice to what looked like at first glance to be a yellow lump on the floor. After a minute they realized it was a man in a yellow sleeping bag. He had a long mane of unkempt black hair that drooped over his eyes, which stared intensely up at them. It felt as if his eyes were staring deep into Izuku's very soul. Standing up, the man unzipped and took off the sleeping bag. He was tall and slim, wearing a black jumpsuit with large white bands wrapped around his neck and shoulders. It took you all eight seconds to shut up, he said. That's not gonna work. Time is precious. Rational students would understand that. Izuku looked the man up and down. He looked completely worn out, as if he hadn't slept in days. His face was passive, unshaven and scruffy, like his hair. Izuku assumed that he must be some kind of pro, though he didn't recognize him. I'm Shota Aizawa, he said. Your teacher, let's get to it. He reached into his sleeping bag and pulled out a red, white and blue tracksuit. Put these on and head outside. The students all gathered around Aizawa, who took them to UAS outdoor track and field. They had completely skipped orientation, which Aizawa had informed them was a waste of time. What's more, he informed them that they would be performing a quirk assessment test to determine if they were fit enough to continue with UAS hero course. Here at UA we are not tethered to traditions, he said. That means I get to run my class however I see fit. You've been taking standardized tests most of your lives, but you never got to use your quirks in physical exams before. Izuku swallowed hard. 
he had always known that he would be coming to UA with a disadvantage, but looking around at all his classmates, he could almost feel the imbalance in the scale of power. They were all going to use their quirks to help them through this assessment. He had to step it up somehow in an effort to keep up. The country is still trying to pretend that we're all created equal by not letting those with the most power excel, Aizawa continued. That's not rational. One day the Ministry of Education will learn. He stopped directly in front of Izuku, staring him down. Izuku could feel the sweat dripping down his forehead. Izuku Midoriya, he said. The upstart. The first student to ever be admitted into UA without a quirk. The class around him audibly gasped, murmuring to each other. He doesn't have a quirk. How did he take down that robot? What is he even doing here? No way he can keep up. Izuku felt his heart sink, but he didn't drop his gaze from Aizawa's. His class was already beginning to write him off, a prejudice that he felt his entire life. I've been looking forward to this, said Aizawa. Front and center, Midoriya. Trembling, Izuku complied, stepping forward past the rest of the students. You impressed a lot of people during the entrance exam, said Aizawa. In the 15 years that he's been a patron to UA, your benefactor has never sponsored another student, until you. He cracked his knuckles. I have planned something special with you in mind. Let's see if you really deserve to be here. Today was not Izuku's day. The next couple of hours consisted of the class going through basic exercise drills, throwing a softball, long jumps, 100 meter dash, etc. Izuku felt he had performed well in all of them, but he was unsure of the results as he was the only one who didn't use a quirk for assistance. He had been getting sideways looks all day. Many tried to hide it, with a few people openly talking about how he had no quirk. Izuku found himself growing more and more annoyed, but he didn't allow it to break his focus. After the exercises were done, Aizawa had them all line up again. He took them to a large, domed building adjacent to the courtyard. Aizawa stopped in front of the giant double doors at the front of the building, and turned to face the class. You all performed adequately, said Aizawa. He pulled out smartphone and tapped the screen. A projector appeared in front of him, showing the results of each student for the exercises. Izuku was dead last. Izuku expected this. He was strong, and he was able to do so much more than he used to with Bruce's training. At a regular school, he would be considered well above average. But without the added benefit of a quirk, it was hard to compete with the numbers of his classmates. On paper, he was the weakest student there. His other classmates continued to mutter to themselves. That's to be expected. He doesn't have quirk, after all. Are we sure he really destroyed that robot? Maybe it was a fluke. Do you think they'll send him home? Izuku tried to ignore them, but deep down felt a pang of fear in his heart. What if they did send him home? How would Bruce react? Would he cast him out as well? All these questions blared through his mind. But your test doesn't end here, Aizawa said. For the next three years, Yue will throw one terrible hardship after another at you. Think of this as a teaser. Aizawa tapped another button on the screen of the smartphone. The large double doors slowly opened behind him, revealing to class one of the most arduous and unforgiving obstacle course that they had ever seen. Several of the robots that were at the entrance exam were there, poised and ready to attack. Conveyor belts running at extreme speeds, swinging pendulums, even a ring of fire. The class gasped in unison as they saw it. Say hello to the gauntlet, said Aizawa. We're going to run that thing, said a boy with spiked red hair. Not you, no, said Aizawa. He then pointed to Izuku. Just him. What do you mean just him? Said Yuraraka. Midoriya scored lowest on the exercises, said Aizawa. This is a final test of his ability to attend UA. If he is not able to complete the gauntlet, then he has no place being here. What are you saying, sir? Asked Ida. If he doesn't succeed in completing the gauntlet, said Aizawa. He goes home. The students gasped again. You can't send him home, said Yuraraka indignantly. He just got here. We all have. It's not fair. You think natural disasters are fair? Aizawa shot back. Or power-hungry villains. The world isn't fair. It's a hero's responsibility to counteract the unfairness. It's also a hero's job to put others before himself. What does that mean? Said Yuraraka. If he refuses to do the gauntlet, you're all going home, said Aizawa simply. The group went dead silent, all turning to Izuku. He was used to being singled out, but never to this extent. As he looked to all his classmates, his eyes landed on Yuraraka. Tears filled her eyes as she stared back at Izuku. He could read her as if he was able to stare into her mind. The indignity and unfairness of this situation made her both angry and afraid. She didn't want Izuku to be sent home, but was also terrified. If Izuku didn't do it, all of her hard work, all of her hopes and dreams would come to a grinding halt. 
He couldn't let this be the end for her, not after how much she has riding on this. With a defiant glare at Aizawa, Izuku marched towards the entrance of the gauntlet. That's it, kid, thought Aizawa. Show me what you can do. The gauntlet. How did Izuku keep getting into these messes? All his life Izuku tried his best to stay out of trouble. Usually, however, trouble would find him, and it was almost always in the form of Kakin. The constant bullying from his childhood playmate and his cronies only encouraged others to look down on him, not only by his other classmates, but sometimes even his teachers. Izuku was treated like he was broken, a freak in a world where freaks were the norm. As he stared down the terrifying gauntlet before him, he realized that no matter how many times he tried not to stand out, it was inevitably his destiny to do so. And if that was his destiny, then he was going to stand out above the rest of them. He was going to surpass them all. The time starts now, said Aizawa, starting the timer on his smartphone. Get to it. Izuku wasted no time. He sprinted at full speed down the path of robots. Immediately, they all locked onto his location and began their attack. He's done for, shouted the pink-skinned girl. I don't approve of this kind of hazing, said Ida through gritted teeth. But I suppose we have no choice. Iraraka could hardly bear to look, but didn't dare turn away. Two zero-pointer robots advanced on Izuku. They were the exact same make as their giant counterpart from the entrance exam, but roughly the same size as the other robots. In unison, they swung their robotic arms at him with great speed. But Izuku saw it coming, deftly sliding under the attack, and effortlessly springing to his feet, continuing his sprint. As he did, a scorpion robot speedily crawled towards his position and thrust its massive tail at him. Izuku leaped into the air above it, landing atop the end of the tail, and ran down the other end, without batting an eye. More robots were waiting for him. They began to fire projectiles at him, rubber bullets and dummy rockets. The explosions from the guns and rockets as they fired echoed loudly throughout the building. That's insane, shouted the red-haired boy. Sir, you have to stop this, yelled the tall girl with the large ponytail. Aizawa ignored them, focusing on Izuku. Izuku had anticipated the weapons. Even though they didn't use them in the exam, they didn't look like they were for show either. He flipped into the air and landed into a series of handsprings, the rubber bullets passing narrowly behind him as he stayed one step ahead of the robot's guns. The rockets were trickier, but Izuku had an ace up his sleeve. He ripped off the shirt of his tracksuit, revealing his hidden utility belt wrapped around his waist. Aizawa blinked in surprise, so he re-evening the playing field. Smart. Izuku pulled an explosive battering from the belt, throwing it into the launcher of the rocket robot. Beeping for a few seconds, it exploded, destroying the launcher and knocking the wheeled robot next to it off its balance. As it fell to the floor, its gun fired into another robot in its path, the rubber bullets pounding unrelentingly into its optical eye until it cracked and burst, disabling it. Holy crap, said the boy with electric blonde hair. He's beating them. The group cheered as Izuku made his way past the final robots and leaped onto the conveyor belts in front of him. They were going at intense speeds and Izuku struggled to keep up. Aizawa pressed a button on his smartphone, and giant pendulums began to swing towards him. Izuku flipped left and right, successfully avoiding the pendulums and maintaining his speed on conveyor belts. Reaching the end of the conveyor belt, the last pendulum swung towards him. After ducking to avoid it, he leaped upward and pressed his feet into it as it swung back, using the momentum to launch him forward to the next part of the course. Good kid, thought Aizawa. Use your surroundings to your advantage. He pressed another button on his smartphone, and the floor in front of Izuku became electrified, four small pegs rising from the floor. Twisting in midair, Izuku landed gracefully on one of the pegs. There was only room on the peg for one foot, so to maintain his balance, he angled his other leg and arms into a crane-like stance. After pausing a moment, he hopped from one peg to the next, clearing the electrified field. The class roared with applause and cheers behind him. Who is this guy? One of the students shouted. Yuraka and Ida had lost their apprehension and were happily cheering along with them. Keep going, Deku, shouted Yuraka. You can do it. Aizawa wasn't done. Without reacting, he pressed another button on his smartphone as Izuku continued through the gauntlet. The floor beneath Izuku began to open in the middle, and he was running out of space to run. At the same time, the clear walls beside him began to close in at a rapid pace. Thinking quickly, Izuku reached into one of the pouches on his belt and pulled out a small carbon fiber rod. Izuku held it horizontally, leaping upwards from the disappearing floor, and pressed the red button on the side of the rod. It extended outwards at each end at blinding speed, ramming into the walls as they closed, stopping their progress to within barely five feet of each other. The rod suspended from the walls allowed Izuku an anchor as the floor disappeared. 
In a true gymnast style, he swung over the bar, launching himself forward, leaping from wall to wall, and continued on. Finally, Izuku found himself on solid ground and continued his sprint through the course. He came across the final obstacle, a large ring of fire, roaring with blue and red flames, at the end of a long, narrow beam. Izuku didn't stop. He picked up speed as he ran towards the ring. As he got closer, the fire grew larger, wilder, but Izuku didn't yield. With all his might, he leaped towards the ring, his arms and legs extended as he flew into a twirling, spear-like dive. He was inches from the ring. He could feel the heat of the flames on his bare chest. The fire roared and engulfed him as he flew through the ring. When the fire dissipated, Izuku was gone. The class yelled in terror. Deku, shouted Yuraka, horrified. They started to scramble towards the gauntlet to see if their classmate had perished. But Aizawa stopped them. Without a word, he pressed another button on his smartphone, and a large platform behind the ring began to rise, supporting a tired, but otherwise unharmed Izuku, kneeling as he caught his breath. The class was in an uproar. They all ran and gathered around him, cheering and lifting him into the air. What do you think, Mr. Aizawa? said Izuku as they reached him. Do I deserve to be here now? A small smile broke across Aizawa's normally passive face. This kid, he said to himself. It seems Batman chose wisely. Hiding behind a building, the large, muscular All Might watched the whole thing. He had heard that Aizawa was unbelievably strict when it came to his students, and didn't even hesitate to expel an entire class last year because he didn't think they had what it takes to make it as a hero. All Might had wondered if he was going to have the same attitude towards Midoriya, and a part of him hoped that he would. But as he watched Midoriya's performance, he couldn't help but quietly cheer along with them. Midoriya, he said quietly, when did you get so cool? Aizawa had the class gather around him. They were shocked when he told them that he had no real intention of sending anyone home. It was simply a logical deception, he said, with a slight sadistic smile on his face. To get you to take this seriously, he informed them to pick up a syllabus in the classroom and dismiss them all. As he walked back, All Might intercepted him. Aizawa, he said. All Might, said Aizawa, without stopping. Midoriya didn't actually get the lowest score, did he? Said All Might. I watched that whole thing. You just wanted an excuse to get him to run the gauntlet, didn't you? Aizawa paused, but said nothing. It's not like you to play favorites, is it? Said All Might. I'm simply not a fan of the status quo, said Aizawa, as he continued to walk away. Midoriya has a rough journey ahead of him. If he is to be under the shadow of the Batman here at UA, he needs to be worthy of it. All Might laughed to himself. He really is a fanboy at heart, isn't he? All Might watched as Class 1 a gathered around Izuku, still cheering him on, introducing themselves, and asking him about his training. All Might sighed. Now he's making friends, he thought. Still, the boy will have it rough ahead. I don't know if he'll have what it takes to keep up with the rest of them. But as he walked back towards the office, All Might couldn't shake the feeling in the back of his head that maybe, just maybe, he really had made a mistake back on that rooftop. All Might held the old red hero costume that marked his Silver Age period. It was time for him to teach his first class. He'd be lying if he said he wasn't a little nervous. He always had imagined that he would be a good teacher, but in light of recent events with Midoriya and Batman, now he wasn't so sure. He was going to be teaching combat training to the class of 1A. The prospect was daunting to him, especially with Midoriya. He saw his performance in the exam and the gauntlet, but fighting against machines was very different from fighting against a living person. He had to be sure that things didn't get out of hand. He especially wanted to make sure that Midoriya didn't get hurt. But there was also a part of him that was excited to see what else Midoriya was capable of. Since his performance in the gauntlet, Izuku had become quite popular with Class 1A. He had already made some friends, especially with Ida. Despite their animosity when they first met, Izuku found that he was a passionate, helpful and considerate person at heart. He looked up to his brother, the hero Ingenium, and wanted to live up to his legacy, something Izuku respected. All of the students of Class 1A had great quirks, and Izuku could immediately see why they were chosen for the hero program. He made it a point to study all of their quirks, strengths and weaknesses. Batman had lectured Izuku intensely on the importance of knowing the full extent of a subject's ability, even if that subject is your ally. Allegiances are never set in stone, Batman had said. At any time, any given moment, your ally could become your enemy. Knowing what they can do and how to bring them down could be the difference between lives saved and lives lost. It had been a hard lesson to learn at first. He idolized the hero community, and to think that any one of them could turn rogue was a frightening thought. Conversely, word had spread quickly throughout the school that Yue had accepted its first quirkless student. Izuku would receive awkward glances and conversations would hush as he passed them. 
On occasion, he could hear their whispered conversations. Is that him? That's him, the quirkless kid. How did he even get in? I hear he was sponsored. No, he passed the entrance exam. They say he took down the zero pointer. No way. Some of the students from class want to say he even passed the gauntlet. Aizawa's student crusher. I don't believe it. I guess we'll see how long he lasts. Izuku had grown used to the attention, but still found it annoying. But he wouldn't let it distract him. He had to remain focused if he wanted to surpass them. Back in class 1A, Izuku was going over his notebook silently to himself when, I am here, a voice shouted into the classroom. Izuku jumped to see All Might, in full hero form, dramatically posing in the doorway. Coming through the door like a hero, the class gazed in awe and wonder as All Might marched to the front of the room. They were chatting to each other, excited that All Might was teaching here, amazed and starstruck that they could see the number one hero in person. Izuku's face remained passive, but his stomach was churning into knots. It had been over ten months since their meeting on the rooftop. Despite his appearance now, in his mind's eye, Izuku could see through it to the thin, sickly character underneath. Izuku had completely disavowed the hero after their meeting, and seeing him in person again brought back unpleasant memories. The sludge monster, his dream dying, and worst of all, Kaken. When All Might got to the front of the room, his shadowy eyes seemed to focus squarely on Izuku, who simply returned to his notebook as if he noticed nothing. All Might coughed a bit awkwardly. He supposed Izuku's reaction to his presence was only natural. Welcome to the most important class at UA High, he said. Think of it as heroing 101. Here you will learn the basics of being a pro, and what it means to fight in the name of good. The class around Izuku was hanging on to All Might's every word. Right, then, let's get to it, he said. In dramatic fashion, he thrust forward a large card in his hand that said battle on it. Today we'll pull no punches. Fight training. The class started murmuring to themselves again. Real combat. This early? Well, it is UA high. But one of the keys of being a hero, continued All Might, pointing to the side wall of the class, is looking good. Sections of the wall began to open, revealing several numbered locker compartments, each one containing a different hero costume for the class 1A students. These were designed for you based on your quirk registration forms and the requests you sent in before school started. Get yourself suited up and meet me at training ground beta. With a flash, All Might dashed out of the classroom and disappeared down the hallway. All the students gathered around their respective numbers. Izuku opened his locker with a smile. All the students had costumes that were designed by an exclusive clothing company partnered with the school. He was the only one who didn't have a suit made with that company. When he was accepted, he had already come up with a few designs, but never got a chance to send in the form. When he went to the warehouse the night he was accepted, Bruce and Alfred had already surprised him with a suit that they had made for him based on his designs. With some personal additions from Bruce, all compliments of Wayne Tech, now it would be the perfect time for a field test. The students all entered into the training grounds. Each student had a unique costume that was specific to how their quirks, ranging from all different types of colors and materials, they all looked like they had come straight out of a comic book. Izuku stepped out of the shadow of the gate entry into the light of the training grounds. He wore a black jumpsuit made from a composite of Kevlar and ballistic nylon, with flexible carbon armor plating sewn directly into it. The plating was heavier on his chest, abdominals, and shoulders. His hands and forearms were covered by heavy-duty combat gauntlets made from the same flexible carbon composite with three curved blades sticking from the sides. His right gauntlet had a mini-computer in the top of the arm that connected by satellite to the back computer. His boots were thick and insulated, designed for combat and functionality. He wore a black hood to cover his wavy green hair and a black mask that covered his eyes and face. The eyes allowed him to connect to the back computer for cowl vision and detective mode. The mask also served as a voice modulator and respirator for emergencies. The mask connected to and covered his ears, allowing him to utilize radio contact, but also used external sensors to heighten his hearing and peripheral senses. At his waist was his trademark gray utility belt, but with more gadgets and useful support items attached to it, including his trusty grapple gun, remote control batarangs, and a few grenade canisters of his own design. To top it all off, there was a small, black bat symbol etched into the right breast plating. The group marveled at their costume designs. When Izuku walked out, they all took a moment to take in his costume. Izuku looked like a soldier ready to go to war. That costume is so cool, shouted Kirishima, the red, spiky-haired student. I didn't know you could have weapons. Some heroes have support items to help them with their quirks, said Aoyama, the blonde-haired boy with a penchant for fashion. 
like me with my naval laser, he added, brandishing his large belt. But Midoriya doesn't have a quirk, said Yeyarazu, the student with the large ponytail. So if that's the case, these are offensive items, are they not? Izuku found the attention a little overwhelming. Some of them, said Izuku simply, his voice filtering through the mask. I have many tools. That's so cool Deku, said Yuraraka. Izuku took a moment to notice her costume. She wore a skin-tight bodysuit with large gauntlets and boots, as well as a helmet with a clear visor. It was lucky that he was wearing a mask, otherwise she would have seen him blushing. I should have been more specific about what I wanted, she explained. This bodysuit is not really my style. All right, students, shouted All Might. They all lined up, turning their attention to him. Now that you're ready, it's time for combat training. Sir, said a student in heavy armor. I have a question. That's Ida's voice, thought Izuku. So, that's him under there. I see he wanted to go for an ingenium type look. Pretty cool. This is the fake city from our entrance exam. Ida remarked. Does that mean we are going to be doing urban battles again? Not quite, said All Might, holding up two fingers. I'm going to move you two steps ahead. Most of the villain fights you see on the news take place outside. However, statistically speaking, run-ins with the most dastardly evildoers take place indoors. Truly intelligent criminals stay hidden in the shadows. Batman had informed Izuku of the same statistic. This is the exact reason for Batman's modus operandi. If one controls the shadows, the villains have nowhere to hide. For this training exercise, continued All Might. You'll be split into teams of good guys and bad guys and fight two-on-two -two indoor battles. Isn't this a little advanced? Said Asui, the frog-like student. The best training is what you get on the battlefield, said All Might enthusiastically. But remember, you can't just punch a robot this time. You're dealing with actual people now. All Might paused, his finger bouncing from one person to the next as he counted the students. I see that we are an uneven group, so two teams will be paired up as three on three. All Might had the team draw lots to decide the matchup. Izuku was a part of one of the three-on-three -three teams, paired up with Yuraraka and Shoji, the student with tentacle-like arms that can morph into different appendages. The other three-on-three -three team consisted of Ida, Todoroki, and Kirishima. All Might took out a paper. Right, he said. Now that the teams have been selected, here is your objective. The villains have hidden a nuclear missile somewhere in their hideout. The heroes must try and foil their plans. To do that, the good guys have to catch the evildoers or recover the weapon. Likewise, the bad guys succeed if they protect their payload or capture the heroes. We're going to have our three-on-three -three teams go first, said All Might, reaching into two boxes, one reading villains and one reading heroes. Upon drawing, it was determined that Izuku's team were going to be the heroes for this battle. The class walked over to an empty building that would act as the villain team's hideout. Bad guys, you can go on in and set up, said All Might. In five minutes, the heroes will be let loose. Ida, Todoroki, and Kirishima went in. Kirishima and Ida were already discussing strategy. Before going in, Todoroki shot a sideways look at Izuku, one that he could not quite place the meaning of. Izuku shrugged it off and turned to his team. Okay guys, he said. We're up against some staunch competition. We're going to need to keep our guard up. Let's do our best out there. Yeah, said Yuraraka, throwing her fist in the air. Shoji merely nodded in acknowledgement. As the rest of the class left with All Might to the control room to watch, Izuku realized that this would be the first time he had ever worked in a team like this before. He had learned a great deal from Bruce, but he preferred to work alone, and that philosophy rubbed off on Izuku. But Alfred saw things differently and on one occasion even made a point of quoting Winston Churchill to him. There is only one thing worse than fighting with allies, and that is fighting without them. And right now, Izuku could use all the allies he could get. Even though this is training, said Ida, it pains me to be aligned with criminal behavior. Ida, Kirishima, and Todoroki had made their way upwards to the fake nuclear missile. They were readying themselves for the coming battle. Ida was meticulously going over the room, taking in all the details as if with a fine-tooth comb. No sweat, dude, said Kirishima cheerfully. This is just a fake battle after all. Let's just win this thing. You really think it will be that easy, said Todoroki quietly, inspecting the missile. Against Midoriya. You're right, said Ida. He has proven himself to be a formidable opponent, both during the entrance exam and the gauntlet. We must not underestimate him. And then there are the others, said Todoroki. We don't know much about them, other than their quirks. Well, said Ida, Shoji seems to be more geared towards reconnaissance, while Yuraraka is able to make things float. It was effective during the exam, but I'm not sure how well they would fare against humans. Regardless, we'll have to stay one step ahead of them, said Todoroki. I'll stay here and guard the missile. Ida, your speed could come in handy, perhaps you can scout ahead for them. 
Of course, said Ida. I can take on Midoriya, said Kirishima confidently. No way he'll get past my quirk. Then it's settled, said Todoroki. Team's on dear. All Might's voice yelled over the speakers. Your time starts now. I can hear them, said Shoji. One of his arms contorted into a large ear, the other a mouth he was speaking from. They're on the third floor, confirmed, said Izuku, his mask distorting his voice into a deep bass. He was looking upward, the goggles of his mask glowing blue. Before the exam started, he calibrated his detective vision to focus on body temperature. Detective vision could see though the walls and the floors. Just as Shoji said, three red shapes were gathered together on the third floor. One of them took off with blinding speed. He it is on the move, Izuku added. He must be scouting ahead. What about Kirishima and Todoroki? Asked Shoji. It looks like Kirishima took off in the opposite direction. Izuku replied. I believe that Todoroki is staying behind to guard the missile. How can you tell? Asked Yuraraka. The detective vision in my goggles can detect body heat, replied Izuku. One of them has an irregular temperature to them, half red and half blue. It must be Todoroki's quirk. Izuku turned back to Shoji and Yuraraka. I have a plan, but we don't have much time. Ida will be on us in minutes. Izuku took two canisters off his utility belt and handed them to Shoji and Yuraraka. Take these, he said. One for each of you, so you have to make them count. What are they? Asked Yuraraka. Adhesive grenades, said Izuku. They'll release a glue-like substance once the pin is pulled. Ida's speed is impressive, but it's because of the engines in his calves. This means that his speed is limited to his legs. So you're saying, said Shoji, take out his legs, and we've got him. Exactly. What about Kirishima? Said Yuraraka. Kirishima's quirk is hardening, said Izuku. That suggests he's limited to close quarters combat. I'll engage him myself. Once he's down, you two will rendezvous on the second floor, by the window. The window, asked Shoji. What are you going to do? I'm going to confront Todoroki, said Izuku. And here is what I need you to do. Ida sped through the hallways at lightning speed. If he could find the hero team quickly, perhaps he could use the capture tape All Might had given them against them and end this battle quickly. Come out, you hero dogs, he said in his best villain voice. He had concluded that since he was playing a villain in this scenario, he should act the part to the best of his ability. I will find you. That's when he saw him. There was Midoriya, standing down the hallway clear as day. Aha, uh -huh, exclaimed Ida. You can't escape me now, hero. As quick as he could, he ran towards Izuku, capture tape in hand. With blinding speed, so quick that Ida had almost missed it, Midoriya had pulled a small orb from his belt and threw it to the ground. The orb erupted in a puff of smoke, catching Ida off guard. He tried to stop before hitting the smoke, but he was running at full speed, causing him to slip and stumble into the smoke. The smoke stung his eyes and lungs. Coughing, he waved his hand to clear the air. After a minute, the smoke dissipated and Midoriya was gone. Todoroki, Kirishima, said Ida to his comlink. I lost Midoriya. Kao, replied Todoroki's voice. He disappeared in a cloud of smoke. Even as he said it, Ida knew it sounded ridiculous. He what? Said Kirishima. I'll find him. Don't worry, said Ida, getting up and taking off again. Where'd he go? I just saw him. Then he disappeared when he threw that smoke bomb. Can he even do that? He just did. The students were all chattering among each other as they watched the battle on the security monitors. All Might had to admit, it was a clever way to avoid capture. After a minute or so, Ida resumed his course, looking for the hero team. After they split up, Midoriya went off alone, while Shoji and Yuraraka went off together. Ida had arrived a few minutes later and quickly caught up to Midoriya. This was the whole purpose of the test, pitting students against each other to see how well they could plan and adapt to changes. Midoriya was already proving his ability to do so with Ida, but the battle was just starting, and he had to do more if he wanted to win. Ida was trying to catch up with Midoriya, but he wasn't sure which way he went. As he continued to run, he began to think he had gone the wrong way when a small canister rolled into his path. Ida had just managed to see it in time as it exploded into a pale ooze across the floor. He knew he didn't have time to stop. Thinking quickly, he leaped into the air, his momentum carrying him over the ooze and landing him to safety. He turned to see a startled Yuraraka in the corridor the canister rolled from. Nice try, hero, said Ida, but you weren't quick enough. He pulled the capture tape from his belt and proceeded towards her. But there was a loud pop near his feet, startling him. He couldn't move. He looked down at his feet. They were encased in the ooze, past his engine mufflers, restricting his quirk. He looked over to the ooze that he just leaped over, but it didn't extend farther than a few meters. He looked down at his feet again and saw it, a second canister. He tried in vain to pull his feet from the ooze, but it was too late. The ooze had hardened. He was trapped. 
In the name of villainy, I demand you to release me, said Ida, struggling. Suddenly, he felt two large hands clasp around his wrists, pulling them behind him. He turned back to see Shoji restraining him with the capture tape. Midoriya, he said, placing one finger in his ear to activate his comlink. It worked. Ida is down. Ida is what? Ida is down, repeated Todoroki. He was captured. You need to stop Midoriya before they get any further. That was pretty quick, Kirishima said to himself. He was starting to feel a little anxious, but slapped himself. Get a hold of yourself. Be a man. You got this. Out of nowhere, what looked like a large bat came flying towards Kirishima. He lifted his arms in defense, and bat hit him with a metallic clang. He put his arms down to see a bat-shaped shuriken sticking out of his forearm. Because of his hardened form, it didn't hurt him or go in very far, just enough to stay there. Kirishima looked up. Midoriya. He shouted. Izuku turned and ran down the hallway, Kirishima in hot pursuit. I found Midoriya, Kirishima said over his comlink. I'm tailing him now. He followed him through two hallways. Kirishima was fast, but Izuku seemed to be much faster. Turning the corner at the end of the second hallway, he stopped dead. The way ahead was dark and foreboding. It didn't feel right. There was no way this was a coincidence. Midoriya led him there on purpose. But he couldn't back down, he had a job to do. Slowly, he pressed on. I know you're there, Midoriya, he said into the darkness. Come out and fight like a man. From the shadows, more of the bat-like shurikens came hurtling towards him at blinding speed. Instinctively, Kirishima activated his quirk, and they collided with his rock-like skin, one after the other. This time, however, a few seconds after impact, the shurikens exploded. The force of the explosions knocked him backwards off his feet and into the wall behind him. Shaking his head, he stood up and brushed himself off. He had put a large dent in the wall, but he was otherwise unharmed. Nice try, Midoriya, said Kirishima. That's not gonna work on me. Without a word, Izuku dropped from the shadowy ceiling and launched his grapple gun towards Kirishima. The grapple hook wrapped around Kirishima's arm as he raised it in defense. Izuku launched the secondary wire of the grapple gun behind him, which attached itself in a wall. The gun recoiled, bringing Kirishima flying across the hall, past Izuku, and slamming into the wall on the other end with a loud crash. Kirishima lay there a moment, and then staggered to his feet. Is that all you got? He said defiantly. Actually, I was testing you, said Izuku. I wanted to see how durable your skin really is. Well, as you can see, not much can hurt me when I'm in this form, said Kirishima proudly. That makes me feel better, said Izuku. Kirishima blinked. For what? Izuku pressed the button on the explosive gel detonator. The floor beneath Kirishima exploded, crumbling and falling through the ceiling below, sending him with it. He kept falling, and falling, and falling, finally landing with a loud crash, like the sound of a boulder falling off a cliff. Izuku leaned over the crater, staring into the rubble three floors down. You all right? He called after him. Hiroshima returned a weak thumbs up before passing out. I like him, Izuku thought to himself. He's got spirit. Izuku raised Yuraraka and Shoji on his comlink. Kirishima is down. Now for the final phase. Did you see that? Shouted Mainta, the short, purple-haired student. The class was chattering in amazement. All Might found himself once again surprised beyond measure at Midoriya's resourcefulness. Midoriya and Kirishima were on the third floor. Not only did Midoriya rig the floor beneath him to explode, but the two floors under him had exploded as well, sending him down three stories into the rubble below. He used the explosive batarangs and the grapple gun maneuver to test the density of Kirishima's skin before carrying out his plan. If his skin didn't hold up against them, it wouldn't have held up against the fall. He didn't want to hurt Kirishima, just incapacitate him. This was all calculated and planned in advance. This kid was good. Really good. Kirishima. Kirishima. Todoroki had heard the explosion and tried to raise Kirishima on his comlink. As he had expected, radio silence. He was on his own. It wouldn't be long now until Midoriya was upon him. He had to act fast. He threw up a wall of ice around the missile and himself. He didn't think it would stop him, but it would at least slow him down. If he did manage to get through the ice, Midoriya would still have to contend with him. And so he waited. After a minute, he could see the silhouette of Midoriya through the ice. He was inspecting the wall Todoroki created. Todoroki readied himself. He guessed that Midoriya was looking for the right spot to place his explosives. But instead, he put both hands on the ice wall. After a few seconds Todoroki saw a crack in the ice wall. Before he could react, Midoriya punched his way through, shattering the ice wall like glass. Cow, was all Todoroki could say. Izuku lifted his hands. They were glowing red in the palms. Thermal gloves, he said. My mentor has faced a few ice villains in his time, and he designed my suit with an environmental regulator. 
He's not one to leave things to chance. I see, said Todoroki. Let's see how well it works against my ice. Todoroki launched a flurry of frost and ice at Izuku, who leaped away in the nick of time. Todoroki didn't let up his barrage, and continued to throw his ice while Izuku continued to dodge. I see you're only using your right side, said Izuku, back flipping over two ice pillars sent his way. That coincides with the white in your hair. I wondered about that. Hold still. Todoroki was getting annoyed. His ice was more effective in large open spaces. It was difficult to use freely in tight, enclosed spaces, such as the hideout room. It didn't help that Midoriya was so quick on his feet and maneuverable. Your endeavor's son, aren't you? Izuku said. Todoroki froze. He stopped throwing ice and stood dead in his tracks, as if his mind had stopped functioning properly at the mention of his father. I recognize your last name, Izuku said. And you are one of four students who were admitted on recommendation. Which would make sense since Endeavor is the number two hero and alumni at this school. Todoroki didn't know what to say. The way he explained it sounded so simple, but so bizarre at the same time. That begs the question, Izuku continued. Does that mean your left side is fire? Todoroki's eyes widened. His hands were shaking. He looked at his right arm, which was covered in frost. He had used too much of his ice, he was feeling cold. Why don't you use your left side? Asked Midoriya. It wasn't mocking, but a genuine question. If it's anything like your ice, it must be immensely powerful. Stop talking. Todoroki shouted, blasting more ice at Midoriya. He drew three explosive batarangs from his belt and threw them towards Todoroki who threw up his hands in defense. The batarangs arched and flew past Todoroki, missing the missile by inches and embedding themselves into the wall behind it. Foolish, said Todoroki. If this were real, and you hadn't missed, we'd all be dead. I didn't miss, said Izuku. Pressing the detonator, he shouted into his kumlink, Uraraka, Shoji, now. The wall behind Todoroki exploded, revealing to his shock Shoji and Uraraka, suspended in midair outside the building where the wall used to be. Before Todoroki could react, he felt something heavy and strong wrap around him, pinning his arms to his side. Izuku had thrown a wire bola around him to keep him from attacking. Shoji, using all his strength, threw Uraraka towards the missile, who continued to keep them both suspended in midair. All Todoroki could do was watch as Uraraka made contact with the missile, wrapping her arms and legs around it and hugging the side of it tightly. There was a pause, and over the speakers came All Might's booming voice. Tima wins. The class cheered behind All Might. He breathed a heavy sigh of relief. The cleanup robots began their work, and Midoriya was checking on his classmates. Midoriya and his team came through this exercise unscathed, due to his strategy and leadership. Not only did he prove he was capable of operating against foes with strong quirks, but he was able to work in a team function. Simply put, he smashed this exercise. All Might felt he could no longer deny it. Midoriya was becoming a hero. Bruce had trained him better than he ever could. Perhaps all this time he was wrong. Maybe you didn't need a quirk to be a hero. What would Nana think? Nana, all for one. All Might's heart dropped. He still remembered that day, when all for one's reign of terror came to an end. The sheer power of a hundred years worth of stolen quirks raging against him. He was nearly killed, and in the end was very lucky to walk away with just a hole in his side. It was true, Midoriya was strong, and getting stronger every day. But would it be enough? Only time will tell. Revelations Izuku's popularity exploded overnight. His performance during battle training spread like wildfire. Nobody could understand how he had become so powerful, despite not having a quirk. More than once, he was approached by other students challenging him to a match. Izuku always declined. He had more important things to do. The students had returned to their classes and were enjoying a much-needed break before returning home. Izuku took the time to study what he learned of his classmates' quirks during the training exercise. Despite his feelings for All Might, he had good insight on hero work, even if he wasn't very good at teaching it. There was a strong tension between All Might and Izuku. He could feel that the pro hero was trying to connect with him in some way, and would address him directly, and would often purposefully direct most of his questions to him. However, Izuku preferred to avoid him as much as possible, and would oftentimes feign ignorance to avoid answering his questions. There have been a couple of times that All Might had attempted to corner him in the hallway for some reason, but Izuku had always managed to evade him, either by pretending not to hear his booming voice, blending into a crowd of students, or outright disappearing entirely, something Izuku was very adept at, thanks to his training. He had a feeling that he wouldn't be able to dodge All Might forever and eventually would have to face him but he would deal with that later. The day after the battle training, his classmates had voted that he be their class president. He had politely declined. 
He didn't want to be a leader and had no patience for bureaucracy. Instead, Ida and Yairazu were given the job of president and vice president, respectively. Izuku was pleased with this result, as he felt he was already in the spotlight too much already. This was especially so after what happened after the battle training, when Kirishima returned from the treatment with recovery girl, Midoriya. Kirishima said as he burst into the classroom, startling the class. He rushed towards Izuku, who instinctively tensed and reached for his utility belt. Kirishima, however, stopped at his desk, his face beaming. That was so cool, he said excitedly. You were like a total ninja in there. He flailed his arms around, making karate gestures in the air. Where did you learn to fight like that? Could you teach me? Er, Izuku said, blushing slightly. Yeah, said Maita. He and Kiminari both approached Izuku's desk with Kirishima. You took down three of the strongest students here. Where did you learn that? It's obvious, isn't it? The class turned to Takoyami Fumikage, who simply sat at his desk, arms folded and eyes closed, as if in thought. Takoyami was a strong, silent and brooding student. He rarely spoke and preferred to keep to himself. His crow-like appearance and dark demeanor only enhanced his already terrifyingly powerful quirk, Dark Shadow. I noticed it when he completed the gauntlet. Include that with your armor, your weapons, your fighting style, and the answer becomes quite clear. He looked directly into Izuku's eyes. You were trained by the Dark Knight himself. Am I mistaken, son of Batman? The class went silent, all eyes turned to Izuku. As he pondered his answer, he could almost hear his heart beating in his chest. Batman had a mixed reputation in the hero community, and he was concerned about how others would react to the knowledge of Izuku's connection to the Dark Knight. He supposed that he couldn't keep it a secret forever and would have to face the inevitable eventually. He gave out a heavy sigh. You're correct, replied Izuku. The class erupted in unified amazement. The Batman, said Kirishima excitedly. Isn't he a vigilante, said Yeyarazu. I thought he was a myth, said Hanta Siro. No, he's real, he works with the Justice League, said Tsuyuasui. No, he's a founding member of the Justice League, said Fumikage. For real, said Kiminari. Have you met Superman? He asked Izuku. What about Wonder Woman? Said Maita, drooling slightly. Is she just as hot in person? Everyone, please, shouted Ida over the noise. Don't badger Midoriya. Besides, I think we're all missing the biggest question, said Mina. No one knows who he really is. He keeps his identity secret. That's true, said Toru Hagakure, the invisible student. Who is he under that mask? Izuku swallowed hard. This was exactly why he didn't want people to know his secret. The class were all staring at him, excitedly awaiting his answer. Well, Izuku said slowly, he's Batman. Everyone looked at him, confused. I don't say that facetiously, said Izuku hastily. What I mean is, the more time I spend with him, I've learned that the person underneath the cowl is actually a mask, one he wears for the public, or those who don't really know him. He's an important guy, so he has to keep up appearances. When he takes off the cowl, he becomes a different person entirely. It's only when he becomes the Batman is when he is his true self. That, said Kirishima, a slight tear dripping down his face, is the manliest thing I have ever heard. Izuku was busy packing up his things, ready to call it a day. He had been hounded by questions from his classmates about Batman and the Justice League all day, until he was finally saved by Ida again who chastised them for harassing a fellow classmate with inane questions. The sun was already setting. As he began his trek home, Izuku took a minute to bask in the beauty of the dusk. He was always so busy with his studies and training that he never really took a moment like this to reflect on how far he had come and how fortunate he was to be where he is. Fate had finally smiled upon him, and he, young M-I-D-O-R-I-Y-A, Izuku immediately recognized that bellowing voice and knew his momentary hesitation had cost him dearly. He had barely had a chance to react before he felt a heavy pair of hands resting on his shoulders. I am here, said All Might triumphantly, to finally talk to you. Izuku sighed. About what, sir? He asked, not bothering to hide the irritation in his voice. Not here, said All Might. Let's go to the teacher's lounge. I'm glad we can finally have this talk. All Might, having reverted to his depowered form, poured a cup of tea and passed it to Izuku. This was the first time Izuku had seen him in this state since their first encounter. He looked almost dignified in his striped yellow suit, which fit over him as if he was a pole supporting a circus tent. He smiled politely at Izuku as he sipped at his own tea. Izuku sat his tea down on the coffee table in front of him, his face passive. He had correctly assumed that All Might would want to speak with him after getting into UA, but he had nothing to say to the hero. A long silence stretched between them, which All Might broke by awkwardly clearing his throat. I want to thank you for keeping my secret, said All Might cheerfully. 
Izuku still said nothing, his face passive, but his eyes a blazing glare. All Might coughed slightly. Look, said All Might, I know I may have come across as harsh during our chat on the rooftop. It wasn't my intention to come across as such. I didn't want to crush your dreams. All Might sighed, leaning back on the couch and looking at the ceiling. I have been at this for a long time, he continued. I have faced a lot of villains. This life looks glamorous on TV, but the nature of our work is anything but. What people don't understand is that there is always someone out there who is stronger than you. Most people lose sight of that fact during their progression. They don't understand that this hubris costs lives. I've seen heroes stronger than me. He paused for a minute, as if the words were caught in his throat. Heroes who were a lot stronger than me die because of someone with a quirk that was stronger. Izuku listened, his face unchanged. With this fact in mind, All Might said, It's even more difficult, if not impossible, to fight against those quirks without one of your own. It's not fair, it's just the way it is. But that doesn't mean that you can't make a difference in this world. With respect, All Might, Izuku said finally, but do you have a point? My point, said All Might, is I don't want to see you get hurt, or worse. Bruce may have trained you well, and filled your head with God knows what kind of ideas about heroism, but he's leading you down the path of destruction. Everywhere he goes he leaves pain and misery in his wake, and I don't want to see that happen to you, not if I can stop it. Izuku's glaring gaze intensified, like you stopped the sludge monster from murdering my friend. Izuku said quietly, All Might blanched. He looked as if Izuku had physically struck him, but said nothing. Izuku continued to glare at the hero, his clenched fists visibly shaking. You've been my hero for as long as I can remember, all might, Izuku said, breaking the silence between them. I've studied everything about you. I used to think that you were unstoppable, that nothing bad could happen so long as you were smiling. But now I know better. Izuku stood up, straightening his uniform. Young Midoriya began all might. Irredundant, Izuku snapped. A one-trick pony living on borrowed time. Bruce may be complicated, but he's taught me more about being a hero than you ever will. Izuku turned to leave, but stopped at the door. I'm not here for fame or glory, all might, he said. None of that matters. I'm here to avenge my fallen friend, to continue the Batman's legacy, and to prove you and this entire quirk-obsessed society wrong. I will become a hero, a better one than you could even imagine. You can count on that, sir. He spat the last word out as if it were poison, and left, leaving All Might at a loss for words. All Might stroked his chin absently. That could have gone better, he thought sadly. That kid. He's sharp, but he's headstrong. He let out a deep sigh, resting his head on the back of the couch. Teaching is hard. Today's training will be a little different. Maizawa stood before the class, his usual sardonic voice droning over the hushed class. You'll have three instructors, he continued. Me, All Might, and another faculty member will be keeping tabs on you. The students all murmured to each other. Three pros, Izuku thought. Is that because of the break-in? A few days ago, the school had been in uproar when the intruder alarm sounded suddenly during the lunch hour. The students had panicked and ran amok as the building was stormed by story-hungry reporters all chomping at the bit for a chance to interview the symbol of peace turned UA teacher, All Might. The reporters were repelled and order was soon restored to the school. But the fact that they were able to get through UAS security system was a frightening thought. Though the teachers had tried to maintain that everything was status quo, it had not escaped Izuku's notice that security measures seemed to increase around the school. Sir, Siro raised his hand suddenly. What kind of training is this? Rescue, responded Aizawa, holding up a large card with the word rescue embossed in blue bold across it. You'll be dealing with natural disasters, shipwrecks, stuff like that. Disasters, huh, said Kiminari smiling nervously. Sounds like we're in for a big workout. Real hero stuff, said Kirishima. This is what separates the men from the boys. Aizawa activated the costume lockers. This special training is at an off-campus facility, he said. So we'll be taking a bus to get there. That's all. Start getting ready. The students all clambered around the lockers to get their costumes and equipment. Izuku got up to join them. Bruce had trained him extensively on search and rescue and disaster training at the warehouse. He had already demonstrated his prowess in combat, so they all knew he could fight. Izuku gritted his teeth. All Might was going to be there. Another chance to show the false idol that he not only deserved to be there, but was well on his way to surpass him. The bus open layout completely ruined my boarding strategy, said Ida sullenly. Ida, you really need to chill, said Mina cheerfully. The bus jostled slightly as they made their way to their destination. All the students were chatting excitedly. If we're pointing out the obvious, said Asui suddenly. 
Then there's something I want to say about you. She turned to Izuku. Me. He said. What about me, Asui? I told you to call me Tsu. Sorry. You took down arguably three of our strongest classmates almost single-handedly. She said bluntly. It's not surprising considering you were trained by Batman. I'm actually pretty interested to see how you perform during this exercise. How long have you been his student? Eleven months, said Izuku. No way, shouted Kirishima. You learned all that in eleven months. What was his training like? Well, Izuku began, but was interrupted by Tsuyu. It seems you like to use a lot of explosives, she said. Do you have any reason why? Izuku went silent, averting Tsu's eyes. Someone I admired, Izuku said finally. It was his quirk. Explosions? Really? Asked Yuraraka, interested. Sounds dangerous. It sounds awesome, said Kirishima excitedly. He must have been strong. Was he a pro? Did he go to UA? No, said Izuku. He wasn't a pro. He wanted to go to UA but he never got the chance. A shadow passed over Izuku's eyes. He was sweating, his hands were shaking. He wanted to end the conversation now. After ten seconds of silence, his friend's excited expressions turned to concern. Midoriya, said Kirishima. Are you okay? Asked Tsu. Izuku was saved from answering by the voice of Aizawa. We're here. The students all rushed to the window. Over the trees in the distance they saw an enormous, domed structure. It reminded Izuku of Disney's Epcot building. As the bus pulled to the entrance, they noticed a strange figure waiting for them. Standing about five feet tall was what looked like to be some sort of an astronaut. He had a large, rolled body layered inside a thick white suit. Two large white eyes were visible from inside his darkened domed helmet. Izuku recognized him immediately as the space hero, 13. Hello, everyone, said 13 cheerfully. His voice sounded synthetic, as he was speaking through a radio system in his suit. I've been waiting for you. The class gathered around, starstruck by the hero's presence. Thirteen had developed a stellar reputation as a hero who specialized in search and rescue. His quirk, Black Hole, allowed him to destroy large amounts of debris and wreckage in minimal time frames, allowing for quick rescue. He has saved more civilians in a single day than most heroes in their entire careers. It would only make sense that he would be heading up this training session. As they entered the building, Izuku and the others were amazed at the sight before them, a training disaster simulation training grounds that would rival even the Batman's simulators. Holy crap, said Kirishima. It looks like some kind of amusement park. Thirteen pointed towards each of the areas, a shipwreck, a landslide, a fire, a windstorm, et cetera. He said proudly, I created this training facility to prepare you to deal with different types of disasters. I call it the Unforeseen Simulation Joint, but you can call it USJ. Just like Universal Studios Japan, Izuku thought to himself, shouldn't all might be here already, said Aizawa, walking up to Thirteen. Let me guess, he booked an interview instead. Actually, it's something else, said Thirteen quietly, holding up three fingers. Apparently he did too much hero work on the way to school this morning and used up all his power. He's resting in the teacher's lounge. Izuku scowled, thought the other students wouldn't know it. Thirteen's three fingers were referring to All Might's three-hour limit. That man is the height of irresponsibility, said Aizawa, rolling his eyes. Clock's ticking. Let's get started. Listen carefully, said Thirteen to the students. Ensure you're aware I have a powerful quirk. It's called Black Hole. Thirteen held up his hand. Each of his five fingers had caps on the end of them. I can use it to suck up anything and turn it into dust. Izuku looked at Yuraraka. She was hanging on to Thirteen's ever word. He was one of her favorite heroes, after all. Some of you also have powers that could be dangerous, Thirteen continued. In our superhuman society, all quirks are certified and stringently regulated, so we often overlook how unsafe they can actually be. Please don't forget that if you lose focus and make the wrong move, your powers can be deadly. Even if you're trying to do something virtuous like rescue someone. Today, you're going to use your quirks to save people's lives. After all, that's what being a hero is all about, ensuring the safety of others. This resonated strongly with Izuku. Bruce had always told him that the true mark of a hero was not how many enemies you could defeat, but how many lives you can save. Today was the day his training would truly be put to the test. Right, said Aizawa. Now that that's over, a large electrical current ran through the lights above them, interrupting Aizawa and startling the students. Behind Aizawa, the fountain in the middle of the USJ sputtered irregularly, and seemed to twist and morph as a black and purple twisting wall began to form. The wall grew larger and larger at a rapid pace, and Aizawa tensed like a cat. 
The portal erupted in a blast of energy. Something was coming out of it. Stay together and don't move. Snapped Aizawa. 13. Protect the students. Has the training started already? Said Kirishima. I thought we were rescuing people. Izuku immediately reached to his utility belt, grasping onto a batarang. Stay back. Aizawa snapped again. He was placing his goggles on. This is real. Those are villains. The students gasped in terror. A tall, slender man walked through the wall. He was clad all in black and covered head to toe in what looked to be severed hands. Behind him, one after the other, more and more villains piled in droves out of the wall. There had to be dozens of them. Finally, the last one came out of the wall. A hulking, bird-like creature bearing large teeth, two vacant eyes protruding from a see-through, domed structure revealing the creature's brain. It stood at least eight feet tall, rippling muscles across its dark blue body. The hand man signaled the creature to stop at his side. The very sight of it drove a chill down Izuku's spine. It wasn't natural. Izuku tried to turn on his cowl vision. It wasn't functioning. He tried to pull up the interface on his gauntlet computer. It wasn't functioning either. The stark realization of their situation dawned on him. Something was blocking his signal to the back computer. He couldn't radio Bruce for help. They were on their own. Real villains, said Kirishima. No way. How did so many of them get into a UA facility this secure? Yeah, 13, said Yayarazu. Why aren't the alarms going off? Good question, said 13, looking around. I'm not sure. I'm not able to connect to the back computer, said Izuku. What are you talking about, Midoriya? Asked Ida. My cowl and gauntlet computer connect wirelessly via satellite to a computer in a secure location, Izuku explained. This allows me to access various tools and databases, as well as enables my detective vision. But I'm not able to connect to it. This means something must be jamming the signal. That would make sense, said Todoroki. If the alarm sensors aren't being triggered, then one of these villains must have a quirk that's masking their presence here. And if you aren't able to get a signal out, then that quirk is probably blocking all communication as well. Exactly, said Izuku. They carefully chose this isolated facility as an entry point at a time when a class was being taught. They've obviously thought this out. Whatever their plan, said Todoroki, they must have a concrete objective in mind. 13. Get them out of here, said Aizawa, and alert the main campus. You can't fight them on your own, Izuku objected. There's too many of them. Even if you can nullify their quirks, your fighting style's not suited for this. Your powers work best in stealth and one-on-one -on -one fights. It can't be much help in a group. Funny coming from the student of Batman, said Aizawa. He must have taught you that you can't be a pro if you only have one trick. Aizawa leaped into the air and flew down the steps leading to the USJ entrance. His speed and grace could have rivaled Bruce's. Several villains advanced forward towards him as he descended. Shooting squad, shouted one of them. Take your aim. Let's gun him down, shouted another. They lifted their various appendages to fire, but nothing happened. Make work, shouted the leader, looking at his gun-like fingers. Where's my bullets? Aizawa descended on them quickly, launching the wrappings around his shoulders towards the villains. With blinding speed, they wrapped around them, rising and twisting them around in the air. With a mighty heave, Aizawa brought them crashing towards each other, their heads smashing together with a sickening crack. The other villains stepped back in surprise. Idiots, shouted a villain. That's eraser head, the pro. He can erase your quirks by just looking at you. Cancellation, shouted a masked villain with four rock-like arms. Bet you can't erase a heteromorphic type like me. He rushed Aizawa, throwing powerful punches towards him, who deftly avoided each blow with ease. Yeah, you're right, said Aizawa, landing a powerful punch square in the villain's face. The villain lurched backwards from the force of the strike, and Aizawa seized his chance and wrapped his bindings around the villain. But a villain like you is only dangerous if you can reach me, and I have taken measures to make sure that never happens. A large villain attempted sneak attack from Aizawa's flank but the pro was two steps ahead. Aizawa ducked under the villain's extended fist and, twisting on his heel, delivered an axe kick into the villain's torso, throwing him back against two other villains. As the three villains struggled to get to their feet, Aizawa brought the rock villain crashing down on top of them. Which one of you gutter punks is next? He growled. There he goes trying to intimidate us, said Tamura Shigaraki, the hand villain, scratching his neck absently. He is strong, and since he's hiding behind those goggles you can't tell whose quirk he's erasing. He watched Aizawa take down each villain that tried to approach him with impressive speed and precision. He couldn't help but be impressed. He's making it hard for us to work together and rely on each other's powers. His scratching intensified. How annoying. The worst thing about dealing with pros is when they live up to all their hype. 
Behind him, two yellow eyes appeared from the wall of energy. It had not been watching the pro hero's performance. Instead, his gaze wandered to the entrance of the facility, where the group of students led by the Hero 13 attempted to make their escape. They certainly couldn't have that. The students all ran for the exit, with Izuku lingering behind. He's holding them off, he thought to himself. I guess I shouldn't have underestimated him. He quickly ran to rejoin his classmates. Despite all that Bruce had done to prepare him for this day, he couldn't help but feel afraid. His mind wandered to his encounter with the sludge villain, the terror he felt as his world began to fade into darkness. He thought of Kaken and how scared he must have felt at the end. Izuku shook his head. No, now was not the time for that. He would have to be brave. Brave like Kaken. Thirteen and the students stopped abruptly. Another black-purple portal appeared on the floor in front of them. This time, it grew into a large swirling pillar before them. There is no escape for you, said the pillar, two large yellow eyes staring down on them. It's a pleasure to meet you. We are the League of Villains. I know it's impolite, but we have decided to invite ourselves into this haven of justice to say hello. And besides, isn't this a fitting place for All Might, the symbol of peace to take his last breath? So this is their end game, Izuku thought angrily. They want All Might. All of this for All Might. We're all in danger because of him, and the bastard's not even here. His fear forgotten, Izuku was overcome with a burst of hot anger. Leaping above his class, Izuku threw three batarangs, each one exploding upon reaching the shadow. You think we would just stand around and let you tear the place apart? Izuku shouted, landing in front of the thirteen in the class. Hiroshima and Fumikage quickly joined him at his side, ready for battle. You live up to your school's reputation, said the voice of the shadow behind the smoke. As the air cleared, the shadow reformed itself, flowing around what appeared to be a metal collar. But you should be more careful, children. Otherwise, someone might get hurt. You three, get out of the way, right now, shouted Thirteen, removing the cap on one of his fingers. But the shadow was too quick. The purple-black mist swirled around the students, enveloping them. I'll scatter you across this facility, it said, to meet my comrades and your deaths. Izuku shielded himself from the swirling mist around him. He felt his feet leave the ground. He tried to steady himself, but felt himself tumbling head over heels through the black fog for what felt like an eternity. He fell, opening his eyes. Izuku's stomach lurched to his throat as he plummeted head first out of the portal into the water below him. Instinctively, he straightened his body and gracefully entered into the water. His mask helped serve as a short-term respirator for these kinds of situations, so he wasn't worried about drowning. Repositioning himself in the water, he began to swim to the surface. A warping quirk, Izuku thought. Makes sense how they got here. Izuku felt the water around him shift. Someone else was in the water with him. Looking around, he saw something approaching his position with alarming speed. It had the body of a man, but the head of a mutated shark. It had to be a villain. It was nearly upon him, opening its maw wide. A green blur came into Izuku's field of vision. It was Asui, dragging Minda along behind her, moving quickly through the water and slamming her flippered feet into the villain's jaw, knocking it aloft. Hey, Midoriya, she said, surprisingly well considering they were underwater. She extended a long pink tongue from her mouth, wrapping it around Midoriya, carrying both Minda and him towards the ship floating in the water ahead of them. Breaking to the surface, she lifted Izuku and dropped him on the deck of the ship. Close behind him, she dropped Minda as well. Once the two of them were safe, she began to climb up the side of the ship. Thank you, Asui, said Midoriya. You saved me. I told you to call me Tsu, she said. Sorry, this is turning out to be a terrible day of class, said Tsu. Yeah, Izuku agreed. They knew our schedule and who would be here. They must have gotten into the school files during the break-in. With the students were panicking and the teachers were dealing with reporters outside, it would have been the perfect time. Hey, hold on a second, said Minta. It's not like these guys could really kill All Might. Once he shows up he'll pound those villains until there's nothing left. Izuku wasn't so optimistic. The villains had gotten the drop on them, giving them the advantage, as well as had a plethora of potential hostages with all the students there. Not only that, but as indicated by 13, All Might had already used up a significant amount of his power, so even if he did show up he may be in no condition to help at all. Think about it though, said Tsu, as if reading his mind. If the villains spent so much time planning this attack they probably have figured out a way to kill him. Besides, didn't you hear what the smoke guy said? Maybe we should worry more about not getting tortured to death. Otherwise we might not survive long enough to see All Might again. Izuku was impressed. Along with her prowess with her quirk, she was also very intelligent. Not only did she save them both, but she was able to determine the villains' intentions and able to assess the situation logically all the while keeping her mind cool. 
The same could not be said for Maita. The reality of Tsu's words must have sunk into him pretty hard, as he suddenly became very pale beneath his mask and began to shake profusely. No, the pros are gonna save us, right? He asked Izuku imploringly. Before he could answer, the sound of several loud splashes in the water around them interrupted their conversation. The fish villain was back, and this time he had back up. Within moments, their boat was surrounded by at least a dozen aquatic villains. Bad guys, Maita shrieked. Seeing Maita in a state of panic, Izuku could feel the fear he felt at the entrance of the USJ creep back into his mind. Maybe Asui is right, he thought. If they're here for all might, they may have a way to defeat him. Worse, they may know about his time limit. One thing that bothered Izuku, however, was why him out of all the heroes. Was it because his very existence discourages villains and evil? It would make sense. If the symbol of peace were to fall in battle, the aftershock of such an event would be pure chaos. If there was someone out there stronger than All Might, an evil that he couldn't defeat, then there would be nothing standing between that evil and the innocence of society. Even for Izuku, that thought was terrifying. Images began to flash through his head. All Might on the rooftop, suffocating in the sludge villain, the day he learned Kakan had died, the regret and guilt he felt knowing that it was his fault, and Bruce. A memory flashed through his mind of the night he met the Batman. The last words he said to him, You, Izuku Midoriya, will become a hero. That I promise you. Izuku's resolve strengthened. It didn't matter right now what the reason for the villain attack was. It didn't matter right now what brought them here. It didn't even matter right now that All Might may not be able to save them. They were heroes in training, he was the protege of the Dark Knight himself, and if he was going to die that day, he would die a hero's death, fighting till the end. They had to face this evil head on. It's up to us then, said Izuku. Asui and Maita looked towards him, puzzled. We have to work together to keep each other safe, and to keep All Might safe. No one at UA knows this is happening. We're on our own, so let's do what we were born to do. Let's be heroes, Shoji, anything. Ida asked, not taking his eyes off the warping villain. Where is everyone? Shoji contorted several of his tentacle-like arms into different appendages, a couple of eyes, a few ears, etc. They were all working hard, scanning the vast expanse of the USJ facility. They've been scattered across the facility, he said. But our classmates are still here. The students remaining with 13 all sighed in relief. But what do we do? Asked Ciro. The guy is not affected by physical attacks and can apparently teleport stuff. Class rep, I've got a job for you, said 13 suddenly. Run to the school and tell the faculty what's going on here. The alarms aren't sounding, and our phones and radios aren't working right now. We're sealed off from the rest of the world. It'll be faster for you to run than for us to find whoever is jamming everything. Yes, but it would be disgraceful for me to leave you all behind, said Ida indignantly. Go Ida, said Sato, stepping forward in front of Ida. There are lots of alarms outside. That's why they're keeping us all trapped inside the USJ. As long as you can get outside, they won't follow, agreed Siro, joining Sato. So blow this bastard's mist away with those engine legs. Use your quirk to save others, said 13. Be a real hero. Ida was frightened. He didn't want to leave his friends and comrades behind, but he knew they were right. They were hopelessly outnumbered and outgunned. It was their only shot. Even if it is your only option, said the warp villain, launching his dark energy towards them. Are you really foolish enough to strategize in front of your enemy? It won't matter if you know what we're planning or not when I'm done with you. Thirteen shot back, activating his quirk. The black and purple energy swirled towards the opening at the end of Thirteen's finger, absorbing it before it could reach them. Swallowing hard, Ida activated his engines and prepared to run. It was time to fight back. What do you mean fight? Screamed Maita. Are you crazy? Those guys might be able to kill All Might and you think that we can take them. Did you hit your head when we got warped here? Maita was near hysterics. Izuku couldn't blame him. But now was no time to panic. Izuku and Asui were already observing their opposition in the water. There were over a dozen of them, simply floating in the water, waiting. Those villains down there clearly have an advantage in the water, and assume that's where we'll fight, said Izuku. Are you even listening? Said Maita. If that's the case, said Asui, ignoring Maita. They must have known what was inside the USJ before they warped in. Yeah, Izuku agreed. But something wasn't adding up. But for a group with such careful planning, something really sticks out to me, they sent you here, Asui. Ribbit. Su, Izuku corrected himself. They warp you to the shipwreck zone. What does that matter? Said Maita. It means the villains probably have no idea who has what quirk, said Izuku. You've got a point there, said Asui. If they knew I was a frog, they would have sent me to the fire zone. 
They separated us so they could overpower us in smaller groups, said Izuku. Classic divide and conquer, but we can use that to our advantage. For all they know, the three of us could be super powerful, and that's why none of them are trying to climb into the boat. But that means they're not going to underestimate us either. Izuku reached into his utility belt, pulling out a small, round device. I think I have a plan, but I need to know everything about your quirks. Well, said Asui, I can pretty much do anything a frog can do. Jump high, cling to pretty much any wall, and can stick my tongue out about 20 meters. I can also secrete a toxic mucus, but it only stings a bit. Interesting, said Izuku. Pretty useful. What about you, Maita? Maita reached up and plucked one of the round spheres of his head. I've got these sticky balls, he said, placing it on the wall of the boat. Their strength varies. Depending on how I'm feeling they might stick to something for a whole day. They grow back as fast as I can pull them off. The only thing they don't stick to is me. Hum, said Izuku. That might be just what we need here. We don't have much time, so here's what we're going to do. He held up the small device. This is an ice grenade. It'll encapsulate anyone caught in its range within ice in seconds. Where did you get that? Asked Asui curiously. Borrowed tech from one of Batman's longtime villains, said Izuku. It should create a big enough distraction for us to make our escape. Sue, how far would you be able to jump to the shore with the two of us? Not as far as it would be by myself, she said. Probably 20 to 30 meters. This should be enough, said Izuku, taking out his grapple gun. If you can get us within range of the shoreline, I can use this to take us the rest of the way. But what if your ice grenade doesn't trap them all? Said Minta nervously. That's where you come in, said Izuku. While Tsu leaps away with us, you need to throw as many of those sticky balls as you can at them. With luck, they'll get stuck together or at least it will restrict their swimming. Sounds like, without warning, there was a large explosion near the aft of the ship, and it rocked violently in the water. Izuku steadied himself and looked back towards the noise. To his horror, half the ship was sinking. One of the villains must have got tired of waiting and decided to try and force them into the water. They would be submerged in a matter of seconds. Linda began to panic. We're fish food. He screamed. The Sui was still surprisingly calm. Minta, are you sure this hero thing is really right for you? Shut up, snapped Minta. It's weirder not to be scared right now. We just got out of junior high and I didn't think I'd be facing death so soon after joining UA. Izuku slapped Minta across the face with a loud smack. Minta stared at him, dumbstruck and clutching his cheek. You have to stay calm, said Izuku. I know you're scared. I'm scared too. But if we're going to survive this, it's now or never. Now be the hero I know you can be in fight. Minta nodded. Okay, I'm ready. Me too, said Asui. Izuku positioned himself on the side of the ship. Good, now let's get the hell off this boat. And with that, he leaped off the side of the boat and into the air. Time to make Kakin proud. Stupid move kid, said an aquatic villain. Izuku had jumped off the boat and towards the villains. They hadn't noticed the device in his hand. They all prepared for their attack as soon as Izuku hit the water. In a flash, Izuku threw the ice grenade, which hit the water with a small splash. What was that? Said the fish villain. I don't know, said another villain. Where did it go? There was a large flash, and the villains found themselves quickly being encased in ice. What the hell? Shouted a villain. Why ice? How did he? Uh, the ice stopped, trapping nearly ten villains in its wake. The trap extended at least 20 meters, and those villains that weren't trapped quickly swam away to get out of its way. Now was their chance to escape. Su, Minto, now. Izuku shouted. Asui leaped from the ship with Minto in tow. Izuku felt Asui's tongue wrap around his torso and pull him closer towards them. The other villains began to realize what they were doing and attempted to follow them. This time, Minto was ready, throwing sticky ball after sticky ball in their direction. The villains began to falter, some sticking to each other and others sticking to themselves, no longer able to swim. Not too shabby, said Asui. You guys are amazing. I guess we passed the shipwreck zone, said Izuku, launching his grappler gun to the shoreline. Now let's get back to the others. In the landslide zone, Todoroki was using his own ice powers to subdue the villains he was facing. So the plan was to scatter us and then kill us, he said, casually strolling up to the frozen villains. You are woefully unprepared. In fact, it looks to me as though you've had no training. You haven't the slightest idea how to use your quirks. The villains all stared in terror as Todoroki walked past them. He had given them no chance to attack. The moment they warped there, they were overwhelmed at the sheer power of his quirk. Two more villains attempted to get the jump on him, but were easily encased in ice themselves. These villains seemed to him to be just pawns, not as threatening as they first appeared. 
more like street thugs than actual supervillains. From what he could tell, there seemed to be only a few dangerous people here. The warping villain, the hand villain, and that large bird creature. What they needed was more information. They needed to know who their attackers were and what they could do. Listen well, he said to the villains. If you stay frozen, your cells will slowly die as your body succumbs to frostbite and hypothermia. He heard several of the villains whimpering in fear. Luckily for you, I want to be a hero, so I'd like to avoid any unnecessary cruelty. He walked towards one of the frozen villains, placing his hand an inch away from his face, frost flowing freely from his hand towards the villain, who began to cry. But, said Todoroki, I can only do that if you tell me how you plan to kill All Might. Ah, black hole, said the warp villain, a quirk that sucks up matter and turns it to dust. Such an astounding power. There seemed to be no end to the black energy that this villain was putting out. Thirteen had been sucking up the power for at least a minute, trying to buy Ida enough time for him to escape. If he couldn't open a window wide enough for him, there would be no hope for them to warn the others of the danger they were in. You're a rescue hero, 13, the warp villain continued, skilled at saving people from disasters. The villain began to form another warp portal. Consequently, that means that you have little fighting experience or battlefield awareness. A huge warp gate appeared behind 13, taking the hero by surprise. With a sickening crunching sound, 13's back completely ripped open as the force of his own quirk began to tear him to shreds. How unfortunate, said the warp villain mockingly. You've turned yourself into dust. 13 collapsed in a heap. I'm sorry, he said. He got me. 13, shouted Mina. Ida, get out of here now, said Sato. Ida wasted no time. With an eruption from his calf engines, he sped around the warp villain at lightning speed. But the villain was fast as well. A sheep trying to escape from the wolves, said the villain. We can't have that. A warp gate opened above Ida. The villain was attempting to warp in front of him and stop him in his tracks. But the students were ready. Shoji leaped and wrapped his arms around the villain, rolling him out of Ida's way. Run, he shouted. I've got him. Ida made a break for it. He was close to the doors. He had to make it outside. He couldn't let anything stop him from saving his friends. Impertinent child, shouted the warp villain. He shook Shoji loose and was gaining on Ida. I have no time for this. Be gone. Ida was enveloped in the black mist. Ida closed his eyes as the mist encased him. He had failed. But the mist began to dissipate. Ida opened his eyes and looked back to see the villain floating away. Yuraka was grabbing hold of the metal collar that the villain was emanating from. He's wearing some kind of weird armor, she said. He must have a body somewhere in there. She threw the collar high into the air, and the villain went with it. Run, Ida. As the villain flew into the air, he tried to rally and fly towards Ida, who was prying the doors of the USJ open. A large line of tape was shot from Ciro's arm and attached to the back of his armor. Sato seized the tape and began to swing the villain around through the air with his immense strength, finally launching him inward towards the USJ, away from Ida. Ida was outside. In a flash of light and a roar of an engine, he was gone. The villain was helpless but to watch as Eater ran off into the distance. He was going to call for backup. The pros would be upon them soon. The villain knew that they had failed. Izuku hoisted himself onto the shoreline, reattaching his grappling hook to his belt. They had made it away from the shipwreck and the water villains. Now they had to quickly find the teachers and their classmates. If they worked together, they might be able to push back the villains and alert the main campus. Izuku saw Aizawa in the distance. He was still fighting off the surrounding villains, but his movements were slower. He was getting tired. The hand villain seemed to have gotten tired of waiting and advanced on him. Aizawa launched his binding towards the villain, who deftly caught it in his hand and continued charging. Aizawa lunged himself towards the villain, striking him in the torso with his elbow. But on closer inspection, Izuku saw that the villain had caught it in his hand. Aizawa's elbow turned an ashen gray in the villain's grip. His shirt sleeve began to crumble as if made of paper. His skin cracked and broke, falling off and turning to dust, exposing the red muscle underneath. Aizawa leaped backward, his elbow destroyed. The villain seized their chance and advanced on him. Though one arm was useless, he continued to hold the villains off, but his attacks were slower, weaker. That annoying quirk of yours isn't suited for drawn-out fights against big groups, is it? Izuku heard the hand villain say. Don't you think you're a little out of your element here, Eraserhead? But despite knowing that, you didn't hesitate to jump into the middle of this fight. To put your students at ease. More villains attacked Aizawa, who evaded them, trapped them in binding, and threw them into each other. He faced the hand villain, breathing heavily, bindings in hand. And look at you, said the hand villain. You're still standing. You really are so cool. Oh, by the way, hero, I'm not the end boss. Aizawa looked up as a large shadow loomed over him. 
A large bird creature was standing over him. Izuku watched in horror as the creature began to beat his teacher mercilessly. You can erase people's powers, said the hand man. That's irritating, but it's nothing impressive. When faced with true, devastating power, you might as well be a quirkless child. The creature snapped Aizawa's arm like a twig, causing him to cry out in pain. It smashed his head into the ground, his blood spattering across the floor. Izuku couldn't take it anymore. Let him go. The hand man turned towards the noise. Izuku was charging at full speed towards him, batarangs at the ready. No one was going to die today, not while he was here. Leaping into the air, he threw his batarangs towards the villain. Namu, said the villain lazily. With blinding speed, the bird creature jumped in front of the hand villain, shielding him. The batarangs collided with his skin, but dropped to the ground as if their razor edges were made from tinfoil. Asui seized her chance, using her tongue to move Aizawa away from danger. Fall, you bastard. Izuku screamed, throwing every explosive he had at the creature, batarangs, grenades, everything. Smoke billowed and villains were thrown backwards in the blast. After his supply was exhausted, Izuku stopped. The monster was unharmed. No, Izuku thought, horrified. That's not possible. Then it dawned on him. This was the ace up their sleeve. This was what they were going to use to kill All Might. Being so close to it, and witnessing its power, he was afraid it really could. That was pretty close, said the hand man, picking up one of the discarded batarangs. But you're not using a quirk. How interesting. Suddenly, the warp villain appeared beside the hand man. Tamura Shigaraki, he said. Kurajiri, the hand man, Shigaraki, said back. Did you kill 13? The hero is out of commission, said Kurajiri. But I was unable to scatter all of the students and one of them got out of the facility. What? Shigaraki said angrily. He began to scratch agitatedly at his neck. Kirajiri, you fool. If you weren't our warp gate I'd tear apart every last atom in your body. He scratched harder, growling and twitching like a rabid dog. There's no way we can win if dozens of pros show up to stop us, he said, finally calming himself. It's game over. Let's go home. Izuku was taken aback. This was their game over. If this creature really was strong enough to beat All Might, why would they run now? Shigaraki turned to face Izuku. But before we go, he said, let's make sure the symbol of peace is broken. He ran towards Izuku with surprising speed, thrusting his hand towards Izuku's face. Izuku winced, preparing himself for what came next. He underestimated Shigaraki, not expecting him to move so quickly. He didn't have time to get out of the way, and now he was upon him. He felt Shigaraki's fingertips touch his face. But nothing happened. Shigaraki grunted impatiently, turning to the broken Aizawa being supported by Mainta and Asui. He was using his quirk. You really are so cool, said Shigaraki. Izuku acted instinctively. He grabbed the battering Shigaraki was holding and stabbed it into the villain's hand, deep enough that it sliced through and stuck out the other side. Shigaraki roared in pain and anger, kicking Izuku in the torso, sending him backwards. Izuku rolled and sprang to his feet and reached for more batarangs, but he was out. You little brat, snarled Shigaraki, ripping the batarang out of his hand. You cheating little bastard. I'm done with you, Namu, he ordered, turning to the creature. It launched itself with speed that would rival Ida's, grabbing hold of Izuku. He struggled to free himself from its grip, but it was too strong. The creature wrapped its hand around Izuku's head. It would only take a small amount of pressure for this creature to crush his head like a grape. Minder reached for the sticky balls on his head, and Sue launched her tongue towards Izuku to grab him, but it was a futile effort. There was no more time. He was out of time. It was over. He braced himself for the inevitable. And sorry, Bruce, thought Izuku. Forgive me, Kakan. A large explosion shook the foundations of the facility. Izuku opened his eyes and looked towards the source. The front doors of the USJ were blown right of their hinges. Dust and debris billowed from the open entryway. As the dust settled, a single figure stood among the wreckage. There is no need to fear, students, said All Might. I am here. The entire USJ was silent as All Might marched through the front gate. Even the attacking villains stopped and stared in awe and terror at the symbol of peace. But something was different about All Might this time. He wasn't smiling. All Might was cursing himself on the way here, and hadn't stopped since he reached the USJ. I can't believe all this went down while I was resting. He thought angrily. He had not been able to raise Aizawa or Thirteen on their phones and had grown worried. The principal had encouraged him to rest and not to worry, but All Might couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. Gathering enough strength as he could muster, he made his way to the USJ, running into a frantic and frightened Ida along the way. I hate to think of how frightened these children must be, he thought shamefully, looking down at the heavily damaged 13 as he passed, and how hard my colleagues had to fight in order to protect them. 
The only thing I can do now is to reassure them that everything is going to be okay. That is my duty as the symbol of peace. He reached up to his tie and tore it from his neck, casting the shreds aside. He was going to make sure these villains paid for their transgression. Shigaraki and Namu seemed to have lost complete interest in Izuku and his friends. Namu had released Izuku, and Asui had pulled him to safety. After all this waiting, said Shigaraki, the heroic piece of trash shows up. Holy crap, it's all might, said one of the villains. I've never seen him in person before, said another. I didn't expect him to be so huge. This is no time to talk, you idiots, shouted a steel-armed villain. If we're quick we can kill. In the blink of an eye, the villains were incapacitated. All Might still moved at blinding speed, even with his injury. Izuku knew he must be pushing himself past his limit, but did a great job at hiding it. He made his way towards Shigaraki and Namu, looking towards the barely conscious Aizawa. Took you long enough, said Aizawa. I'm sorry, said All Might. I should have been here. In another flash, Izuku found himself being carried away from the villains. All Might had carried all of them, including the injured Aizawa, away to safety. Everybody back to the entrance, he said. And take Aizawa with you. He doesn't have much time. Maita and Asui obeyed at once, running towards the entrance, supporting Aizawa as they went. Izuku, however, stayed put. This was the second time that All Might had saved him from certain death. All Might, Izuku began. But he was interrupted. Shigaraki seemed to be in the middle of a conniption fit. He had his hand covering his face, the force of All Might's speed knocking his mask off. No, 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 he said angrily. It wasn't supposed to go this way. He knelt down and picked up the severed hand that dropped from his face. He's still fast, father. Somehow he managed to hit me. He placed his mask back on and sighed. Of course a government hero relies on violence, he said. I wasn't prepared. I couldn't even see him when he moved. But he's not as fast as I thought he would be. Not as fast as he used to be. I guess it's true after all. A perverse smile broke out across Shigaraki's face beneath his mask. All Might really is getting weaker. Izuku swallowed. His fear was confirmed. They somehow knew that All Might was losing his power and were planning on using that to their advantage with Namu, who was undoubtedly at its physical prime. All Might, he said, you can't fight him. I threw enough explosives at the brain villain to destroy a building, and it didn't even phase him at all. He's too strong. Young Midoriya, said All Might, holding up a hand, his trademark smile returning. I got this. Without another word, he charged towards Shigaraki. Carolina, Namu, said Shigaraki. Smash. Namu had stepped in front of Shigaraki just in time, unaffected from the force of All Might's smash. The Namu let out a guttural, high-pitched sound as its wandering eyes focused on All Might. It lunged at him, trying to grab him. All Might ducked under his arms, following up with a haymaker to its torso. I guess Midoriya wasn't wrong saying you were strong, he said. Let's try this. He began to lay a barrage of attacks to the Namu's face, each one stronger than the last. The Namu still seemed unfazed, continuing its attempts to seize him. Namu has shock absorption. All might, said Shigaraki. The only way you are going to hurt him is to slowly gouge out his flesh. Of course, I don't think he'll sit back and let you do that. He giggled with glee. You finally met your match, All Might. Thanks for telling me how to beat him, said All Might, getting behind Namu and throwing him into a suplex. All I have to do is wear him down, and it's on to you. Izuku shielded himself from the blast of All Might's suplex, dust and debris flowing upward and out into a cloud around them. Izuku didn't want to stay on the sidelines, but he didn't dare get involved. They were moving so fast it was hard to see, and if he tried to help, he would just get in the way, or worse, be taken hostage. The best he could do was get to a safe distance and try to help the others escape. As much as he hated him, he had no choice but to put his faith in all might. Izuku took out his grapple gun, looking for a good place to zipline away. But before he could, he looked in horror towards all might and the Namu as the dust settled. The warp villain was back, and he had used his quirk to bring warp the Namu through the ground, his head sticking out a few feet below all might, finally allowing the creature to grab hold of him. What's worse, he was grabbing him right on his injury. Blood began to seep from All Might's mouth and side where Namu's large fingers began to bury themselves deeper. You were trying to bury him in the concrete so he couldn't move anymore, said Shigaraki. But that won't work. Namu's as strong as you are. That won't stop him. He turned to the warp villain. Nice work, Kirajiri. We have him right where we want him. All Might let go of the Namu and began to struggle at its hand, trying to remove its fingers from his side. The Namu began to sink deeper into the warp gate, until All Might was sticking halfway out of it. Normally I wouldn't want blood and viscera flooding the insides of my warp gates, said Kirajiri. But I'll make an exception for a hero as great as you. 
The gate began to close around All Might, who grunted in pain as it grew tighter. I'm going to enjoy tearing you to pieces. Izuku couldn't go now. No matter the cost, no matter how he felt about him, he wasn't going to let them kill All Might. He launched the grapple hook towards Kirijiri, latching onto his armor. He growled in surprise and anger as the grapple line reeled him in towards Izuku, who, upon reaching him, slammed his armor into the ground. Shigaraki flinched in surprise as his trump card disappeared from his side. As if on cue, a path of ice quickly crept across the ground, freezing the Namu's entire right side in ice. It was Todoroki. One of your poorly trained thugs told me you're here because you think you can kill All Might, he said. With the Namu frozen and Kirijiri subdued, All Might loosened the monster's grip on him and thrust himself towards his two students. Shigaraki looked up in alarm as he saw Kirishima flying towards him, narrowly dodging his oncoming attack. Kirijiri tried to move under Izuku's hand, but Izuku pressed down harder on his armored body. Don't even think about it. Izuku snarled, taking a stun gun from his belt and sticking it against the villain's armor plating. Electricity seared around the villain, who roared in pain as his dark mist sputtered and flared erratically. This is enough electricity to stop the hearts of five men. Interesting that a being made of mist has to wear armor. You must be protecting some kind of body under there. Try to move an inch again and I'll zap you into your next life. Kirijiri growled in frustration, but did not move. Kirijiri said Shigaraki irritably. How could you let this brat get the better of you? You've gotten us into a real jam here. He scratched his neck inquisitively. They escaped uninjured and captured my two strongest men. Kids these days really are amazing. They make the League of Villains look like amateurs. Can't of that. Namu, he added, turning to the creature. The creature pulled itself through the warp gate and tried to stand. There was a sickening crunching sound and the creature's frozen arm and leg broke off. Izuku blanched. How was this thing still moving? The creature's eyes rolled back into its head. The ice broke off from his body, and new muscle began to sprout from his body, replacing his missing appendages. What is this? Said All Might. I thought you said his quirk was shock absorption. I didn't say that was his only quirk, sneered Shigaraki. Namu has been modified to take you on even at 100% of your power. He's basically a highly efficient punching bag that hits back. Shigaraki turned to Izuku. First we need to free our method of escape. Namu. The Namu was fast. Very fast. As fast as all might, maybe even faster. Before he could even blink, Izuku heard what sounded like an explosion and was thrown away from his captive, hitting the ground hard where his friends stood. Hiroshima rushed to his side, helping him up. When Izuku stood to get his bearings back, he saw the Namu was standing by Shigaraki with the warp villain Kirijiri in hand. All Might was gone. What happened? said Kirishima. Where's All Might? He was answered by a cough coming from the shattered wall behind them. A cloud of dust billowed around the rubble and debris, dissipating slowly to reveal a panting All Might, his once nice suit and shirt torn and frayed from the Namu's attack. Izuku began to understand. The Namu hadn't thrown him. All Might had protected him from its attack. These are kids, said All Might. These are kids and you didn't hold back. I didn't have much choice, said Shigaraki. He was threatening my companion. Besides, these kids are no angels. He held up his bloodied hand, nodding towards Izuku. This brat stabbed me with one of his throwing knives. This won't heal overnight, you know, and will more than likely cause permanent damage. What kind of hero does something like that? You think you can get away with being as violent as you want if you say it's for the sake of others. That pisses me off. Why do some people get to decide that some violent acts are heroic and others are villainous? Casting judgment on what's good and what's evil. You think you're the symbol of peace. You're just another government-sponsored instrument of violence. And violence always breeds more violence. All Might did not look convinced. You're nothing but a lunatic, he spat back. Criminals like you, you always try to make your actions sound noble. But you're only doing this because you like it. Isn't that right? Shigaraki didn't answer, but his silence spoke volumes. All Might had him figured out. Hiroshima, Todoroki, said Izuku quietly. Wait for my signal. They nodded to him. All Might clenched his teeth. He only had little more than a minute in this form. His power was declining rapidly, more so than he anticipated. He had to stop these villains and save these kids no matter the cost. But he had to do it fast. Namu, Kirijiri, kill him, said Shigaraki. I'll deal with the children. Let's clear this level and... Shigaraki was interrupted by a loud boom. Beside the Namu, Kirijiri shrieked in pain as the back of his plate armor erupted in an explosion of flames and smoke, sending him flying over the heads of All Might and the students. Izuku was holding a detonator behind his back. 
The mine he had placed on Kirajiri's armor had worked perfectly. Kirajiri, Shigaraki shouted. No, 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 no. Now, with lightning speed, Izuku ziplined over to Shigaraki, knocking him off his feet with a flying kick. Shigaraki turned to see why the Nam wasn't there to protect him, but saw that its legs were once again encased in ice, preventing it from moving. Shigaraki clambered to his feet, narrowly dodging an onslaught of attacks by Kirishima and Izuku. He was faster than them, but only just. All Might seized his chance and charged the Namu. Wrapping his arms around the monster's torso, he ripped it from its ice entrapment and flung it into the air. Leaping up with it, they began a flurry of simultaneous attacks against each other, each punch an explosion of kinetic energy and power. Izuku and Kirishima continued their fight with Shigaraki who began to sweat. Kirajiri was nowhere in sight. Their way out was once again taken from them, and the pros could be here any minute. These brats were stronger than even he had anticipated, and the green-haired one had managed to outmaneuver him. That pissed him off. That pissed him off a lot. The USJ shook violently as All Might and the Namu returned to ground below in their struggle, sending a powerful shockwave that sent Shigaraki and the students flying. Izuku grabbed onto Kirishima and shot a grapple hook into a nearby support beam. Todoroki put up a pillar of ice, protecting him from the blasts. Shigaraki flipped in midair, steadying himself and landing several meters away from where he was. All Might and the Namu's fists collided together. The Namu's arm seemed to buckle under the force of All Might's blow, but he quickly recovered. Their blows continued, but All Might's began to slow. The creature took advantage of his momentary lapse and began to land its heavy fists on All Might's bloodied side. The symbol of peace faltered, trying to rally, increasing his attacks, but the Namu was able to meet them easily. This is bad, thought Izuku. He's almost out of time. His blows are getting weaker. If this keeps up the Namu's gonna kill him. Todoroki, shouted Izuku to his comrade. Use your ice. They're moving too fast, said Todoroki. I can't risk hitting all might. Your time is over, symbol of peace, shouted Shigaraki shrilly. You're old, you're weak, and your brats are next. The Namu landed another blow onto All Might, sending him to the ground below. The Namu slammed his large foot onto All Might's head, pinning him to the ground. All Might struggled to remove it, but it was too strong. Damn it, thought All Might. My power is decreasing. I can't get this guy off me. This was looking bad. Very bad. The children were in danger. If he couldn't stop this beast they would surely die. He couldn't fail them, not now. But the Namu didn't let up, and All Might could hear his bones cracking, his blood flowing freely and Shigaraki laughing in perverse glee. There was a huge crashing explosion and a flash of light, and the Namu was knocked backwards with tremendous force. Shigaraki's laughs were abruptly cut short, replaced instead by angry confusion. N-O-M-U, he shouted. How? What could possibly hurt my Namu? He turned to find the source of the blast, and his question was answered. Rolling through the open gates of the USJ was an enormous, tank-like vehicle. It was heavily armored, with huge treaded wheels and various assorted mounted weapons, smoke emanating from the largest sitting atop it. What the hell is that? shouted Shigaraki in surprise. Izuku recognized it on the spot. It was the Batmobile. Batman, shouted Izuku, waving his arms. We're down here. The Batmobile rolled forward down the steps towards them. The remaining villains watching the fight between All Might and Namu began attacking it. The Batmobile fired its various railguns mounted to it, mowing the villains down. Izuku knew they were only rubber bullets, but they still wouldn't be getting up anytime soon. As the Batmobile reached ground level, more people came through the entrance behind it. The UA teachers, lead by none other than their class rep, Ida. Our first priority is the safety of the students, said Principal Nezu. The teachers broke off and started rounding up and beating the remaining villains scattered about the USJ. The Namu emerged from the wreckage, seemingly unscathed. The Batmobile launched more rockets, and the Namu was thrown backwards several more times. Izuku gasped. Each rocket was powerful enough to levy buildings, and with each blast, the Namu was thrown backwards further and further. Its shock absorption quirk was weakening. This meant that it wasn't limitless. It could be hurt after all. Are you going to lay there all day? All might. Izuku heard Bruce's voice projected over the Batmobile's speakers. Or are you going to finish this monster? As if on cue, All Might stood from the crater made from Namu's attacks. I was only catching my breath, said All Might. Thanks for warming him up for me, Bats. All Might, having got his second wind, rushed the Namu in a flash. You may be able to match me at 100%, said All Might. But not when I crank it up to 1 million percent. All Might's blows became quicker, and the Namu wasn't able to catch up, with each blow landing its speed and durability decreased. 
All Might threw an uppercut, launching the Namu into the air. Following closely behind it, the Namu tried to strike All Might, who grabbed its arm and threw it with tremendous force into the ground below. This can't be happening, shouted Shigaraki angrily. Now for a lesson, said All Might. You may have heard these words before, but I'll teach you what they really mean. As the Namu struggled to its feet, All Might reared back, placing every last ounce of power he had left into this final blow. Go beyond. Plus he launched his fist into the Namu's abdomen. The blow erupted into a flash of light, the kinetic energy from All Might's sheer power unleashing into it. Ultra, the Namu was launched into the air, crashing outside of the USJ outer walls and disappearing from sight into the distance. Shigaraki stared at the hole in the wall where his Namu was launched through. His gaze fell back upon All Might, on the Batmobile, and on the students. He cheated, he snarled angrily. Black mist began to swirl around him. Tamura Shigaraki, said Kirajiri. His armor was broken and fractured, but otherwise intact. He was struggling to control his mist, which frayed and sputtered erratically from his armor. We cannot win this, we have to leave. But I arg. Shigaraki screeched in pain. The hero snipe had shot him several times. He collapsed in a heap, and Kirajiri swirled around him, trying to open a warp gate. He turned his gaze towards All Might. I may have failed to kill you this time, said Shigaraki, but your days are numbered. All Might, symbol of peace, I will kill you. The warp gate closed. They were gone. The top hatch of the Batmobile opened up, and Batman leaped out of it with ease. Izuku ran towards him. You're here, he said. I thought you were in Gotham. How did you know? The watchtower teleported me here, said Batman. The bat computer lost track of you an hour ago, and I wasn't able to reach you on your com link. I knew something was wrong. He looked Izuku up and down. But you look no worse for wear. Looks like your training wasn't a total waste. Nice work, kid. He looked over towards Kirishima and Todoroki, the former looking starstruck and the latter as passive as usual. Batman simply nodded and turned back towards the Batmobile. I expect a full report on what happened here, he said before jumping back into the Batmobile. It roared back to life and drove off through the front gate, the sound of its engines growing softer as it drove further away. Kirishima placed his hands on Izuku's shoulders, beaming at him. That was so cool, he said happily. Izuku couldn't help but laugh. Shigaraki spilled onto the floor of the hideout, a darkened dive bar, his blood seeping onto the floor. Shot in both arms and legs, he grunted angrily. All those underlings wiped out. Even Namu was beaten. He struggled as he tried to lift himself up, but the pain was too great. We failed. Those kids were so strong, and the symbol of peace wasn't weakened at all. He lifted his head towards the television at the end of the bar table before him. You were wrong, master. So wrong. No, a voice that came out of the television replied. I wasn't. We just weren't as prepared as we should have been. I agree, said a second voice. We underestimated them. Thankfully we failed under that cheap league of villains name and not our own. And what about the creature the master and I created? Where is Namu? Yes, said the first voice. Why is he not with you? He was blown away, said Kirajiri. What? said the second voice incredulously. It was All Might's doing, said Kirajiri. And the interference of some upstart in a tank we didn't foresee. I believe one of the students called him Batman. Batman, said the first voice. Interesting. Without the precise coordinates to his location, I couldn't use my warp to bring Namu with us, said Kirajiri. We didn't have any time to search for him. This is a travesty, said the second voice angrily. And after all we did to make him as powerful as all might. Well, I suppose it can't be helped, said the first voice. Unfortunately, power, said Shigaraki. That reminds me, one of the children didn't use a quirk. I don't think he actually had one. Yet he was still able to help protect All Might and even subdue Kirajiri twice. Oh, said the first voice, interested. If he hadn't gotten in our way, Shigaraki clawed at the floor angrily. We might have killed the symbol of peace. Images of Izuku flashed through Shigaraki's mind. That brat, that brat. Naturally, you're upset, said the first voice. But this was not a futile mission. We learned many things. Gather the villainous elite. Take all the time you need. I need to remain hidden in the shadows, which is why I need you to be my face. A symbol of your own. Tamura Shigaraki, next time you will show the world why it should be afraid of you. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 3. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.